I'm uh, Mark Mulvihill, Superintendent of Intermountain ESD, and I'm also the poor man's tour guide. So uh, <laughs> we are glad to have you here in Pendleton. Very, very pleased to have you in our region. Very pleased to have you here today at Intermountain ESD. Uh, audience, as you know, we have the Early Learning Council and State Board. We're kind of doing a combination meeting here in the morning, and the Early Learning Council will continue to meet. State Board will separate with me. We're going on a tour of the region. We're going to go down to the West End, going to the uh, county, the student awards t uh, ceremony tonight. So it's a big day. It actually started last night. And uh, we're really, really pleased that we're combining business, combining visitations, and hopefully a little bit of fun as well. Uh, you know as well as I do that uh, when you get in Salem or you get into our offices, we look at education reform. And we, you know, we work hard, we try to make change, we try to work for our kids, but until you actually get out in the field and actually touch kids, touch programs, feel programs, then that we really, uh, our work is shown to us on a, on, a on a ground level. And it just always affects us. And I know it does me. It seems like every time I get out in the trenches, there's 10, 15 things that I didn't even know yet. And it always helps me as I get back to try to uh, make change for kids. So we welcome you here today again. Uh, we're excited to have you. I think that uh, it's, a, it's a very, very important meeting. I know the Early Learning Council has a lot of pretty critical work to do on the board. So if there's anything you need as far as anything with your technology, anything, phones, any, any kind of logistical thing throughout the day, just let me know. And we've got a staff here that's going to take care of you and get her done. Yeah. So with that, turn it back over to Samuel, Pam. I'm not sure who's. We're, we're going to tag team. OK. Uh, but first, we're going to start out with some introductions. And first of all, of course, thank you to Mark um, and our host last night and all the wonderful people we saw getting those Crystal Apple Awards. That was just a really, really nice piece. And uh, please add our congratulations. They don't know who we are, but um, add our congratulations because it's, it's really good to see, first of all, the districts coming together and then having that sense of interaction with each other and, and uh, really lauding the people who do some very, very hard work on behalf of all of us. So Mark, thank you for being host, and we have another host who is Cam, who we know from uh, a variety of other uh, roles, I guess would be the, the best way uh, to put it, and, uh, and all of the rest of you who are hosting us. Um, as you know, this is the first time we've tried this, and uh, so we put the Early Learning Council and the, uh, the board, State Board of Education together um, but I'm going to interrupt the agenda and ask them to go around and introduce ourselves. And uh, I was in, if you get closer to me, I know this looks like a red tie. There are elephants on the tie. Now, despite what uh, Mark, uh, um, not this Mark, another Mark, uh, asked me about whether that was a party affiliation, um, <laughs> it, it is not. It's a student affiliation. One of my former students uh, uh, returned to uh, Thailand and Cambodia and now works uh, in education there, gave me the tie. Um, and he reminded me last month when I was there that um, it's always important to honor your first teachers. And so as you introduce yourself, I'm going to ask that you honor, preferably an early learning teacher, if you had some that you can remember. Some may have been in the home. Some may have been in various institutions. Um, and I want to call out my kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Beverly. Um, and there's an uh, interesting rumor that she retired right after me. Um, <laughs> But she'd been teaching 38 years. In her first year, uh, second year of teaching, she had my dad, because um, grew up in the same uh, neighborhood. So I uh, just want to honor uh, Mrs. Beverly. And uh, I, I don't remember a lot about it. Uh, my mother says I came home after the third day and said, Mom, there's kids in my class that cannot read. Um, which, uh, which I thought was pretty spectacular and thought you had to do before going. So let's go around and, and introduce ourselves to each other so that board can meet council. And uh, would you please just give us a little thumbnail? Oh, Samuel Henry, I'm, 
<laughs> I'm chairing the board. My day job is at Portland State, where I'm a professor of education, and I'm also a member of the OEIB. Great. Good morning, everybody. I want to echo Samuel's uh, thanks to our hosts uh, for having us here today. Uh, my name is Pam Curtis. I have the pleasure of chairing the Early Learning Council. My day job is as the director of the Center for Evidence-Based Policy at OHSU. Um, my first teacher was my mother, um, and that's what we like to say at the Early Learning Council, is your first and best teacher is your parents. But formally, I went to a number of kindergartens, actually, I have no idea. All in Eastern Oregon and Eastern Washington, I went to three kindergartens. I have no idea what the names of those teachers were, but my first grade teacher was Mrs. Reutz in Spokane, Washington. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm Jada Rupley. I'm the Early Learning System Director, um, and the work that I do during the day is part of this work with the council as well as um, at the governor's direction in the redesign of the Early Learning System. So exciting work. Um, my, uh, I was also going to use the mother story. <laughs> she was not only my first teacher, I think the last thing she did before she passed away was she was still teaching. <laughs> but um, Daisy Maddox was my preschool teacher and she had a preschool that was on a farm and so the only thing I remember about that is that I had never been out in the country and we were out in the fields and I stepped in a cow pie. <laughs> So one of those things that you remember forever. Made an impression. <laughs> it's, great. it's great preparation. Yes. <laughs> boots. You maybe, always have boots. Maybe. I'm Kim Williams. I'm also a council member with North Central ESD Early Education. Our agency delivers healthy families and Head Start services in Gillum, Wheeler, and Sherman County. My mother was also my first teacher, as well as my grandmother, my nana. And then I went to private school, and so I had a wonderful first grade teacher, Sister Teresa, who I loved dearly. I'm Janet Dory Smith, and I don't have a day job. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd love do, to say that. Uh, yeah. I know. <laughs> well, I have to. You know. um, I do some Head Start reviews for the Federal Head Start program, which allows me to visit different Head Start programs in different parts of the country. And I supervise some practicum students in early intervention for Portland State University. And my kindergarten teachers were Mrs. Gates and Mrs. Howard. And I was in a class of 40 plus little children. And they ruled it pretty strictly. <laughs> and I did not speak for six weeks in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. I was quite intimidated by all the children. And the teacher said to my parents, did you know she doesn't talk? <laughs> <laughs> and they did the classic yeah. parent thing. She talks all the time at home. <laughs> and I said, start talking at school. So. <laughs> uh, good morning. They put the Smiths together <laughs> down here. And I guess, uh, like Janet, uh, uh, I. Uh, by choice last year became unemployed for a full-time day job with the uh, Ford Family Foundation. My name is Norm Smith from Roseburg. Uh, <coughs> the, the person that I would uh, honor, and it just struck me how appropriate, Samuel, that you would ask, uh, would be my father, and who for 22 years, and for those of you on the board, um, blessed term limits, uh, but he served uh, on the State Board of Education from Paul Patterson through Tom McCall. 22 years uh, doing what you're doing, and uh, so I have a great appreciation for what you're um, sharing with the state and uh, bringing your time and talent uh, to that work. Um, books like these, I now understand them for the first time. Uh, it, just, uh, it makes all the good sense to me. So I'd like to honor Francis Smith. Good morning, my name is Krista Rood and I work as staff in the Early Learning Division and Head Start Collaboration Director on the Council. And I um, would have to agree that my mother uh, was probably my first teacher and my uh, favorite memories were um, nighttime, right before bedtime reading time. <coughs> we made it through Little House on the Prairie, all of the series and um, a number of uh, precious moments of, of her talking to us and telling stories. Um, and I would also uh, speak to my first grade teacher, Carol Huey, um, in Indiana, in a little tiny school. Um, and she was a really amazing teacher. And I, um, I still remember her teaching me um, different writing skills. And it was a great time. Hi, I'm Vicki Bishop. And I am the Early Childhood Program Manager at the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. 
and I would like to honor all the mothers that got together and cleaned out the broom closet and painted the desks <laughs> because we didn't have kindergarten in our district and kind of started the kindergarten history. <clears throat> and um, love my teacher, Mrs. Cruz. I'm Rob Saxon, I'm the um, Deputy Superintendent at the Oregon Department of Education. And um, let's see, my mom was a career long career long first grade teacher, same classroom, whole career. Wow. My dad was a high school teacher, so I would have to definitely credit them as being teachers. Um, the teacher in school that I would honor is my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Singh, um, who like pushed me like no other person ever did and insisted that I learn to write well. And I <laughs> always appreciated that. My name is Miranda Summer and I'm a board member and my day job I'm an attorney in Portland and I was thinking about early learning and I realized that my uh, my kindergarten teacher is named Mrs. Spring which is funny now because my last name is Summer but uh, <laughs> um, the teacher that had that great impact on me was also my fifth grade teacher Mrs. Coleman and I remember she actually told me you can do anything and it was like the first time somebody <coughs> proactively just said it and I haven't ever forgotten. I'm Randy Shield my uh, day job and night job is superintendent of Tillamook School District and uh, the teacher I guess I would honor is my first grade teacher Mrs. Miller in, in Tillamook she was uh, I was as tall as she was in first grade, which was very special. The, the other thing that I really remember is that one day she brought a man in. Now looking back, it was probably our principal. I have no idea that. <laughs> brought a man in and brought him over to show him to show him how well I wrote. Huh? And it had a lasting impression yeah. on me. So. <clears throat> Buenos dias. Um, my name is Anthony Velis, and I'm from Woodburn, Oregon. Um, I own and, and the owner and founder of ESO Public Relations and Marketing, an agency in Woodburn. Um, I would definitely say my parents are. Um, they taught me um, as farm workers, you know, the work ethic that it was it would take to to survive. Literally, um, they talked about. They taught, taught me how to not become a victim of my circumstances being out in the fields. And to persevere, so I carried all that into my education, and I am where I'm at today. Um, but my first grade teacher is actually back in the days uh, was a Latino, uh, Mr. Arevalo, at the Nelly uh, Mir Elementary School, which is, you know, back there wasn't a lot. I mean, there's not a lot now. We're still working on that, but but um, we're uh, that was really an interesting dynamic. I think that was the best thing that could have happened to me because uh, it was almost like a father figure, um, and so um, yeah. But that's who my role models are and I guess first teachers. Nice. Thank you. Um, I'm Angela Bowen. My uh, parents were both teachers and principals <clears throat> so um, I got taught early on and I had my mom for second and third grade and I had my dad for fourth grade and it was, in, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a two-room schoolhouse it had uh, six grades in it. Mom taught first through third and dad taught uh, fourth through sixth. And by the time I was in fifth grade, they had closed the school and we had to go into town. But anyway, um, one of the things about being a child of a teacher is that there were a lot of reading material around my house. And my parents were avid readers, especially my father. And I just want to bring this up because I can remember books, um, ch children's books all around all the time for us to pick up and look and read. And so I know we're in the age of digital but I still um, just want to make a point that having literature available in physical form, just to look through it any old time, is really uh, helpful for kids. So I want to plug that. Uh, and just want to say um, my um, mom was a lot of fun, and um, she was the inventor of the woolly bear races. So if you know what woolly bears are, then you're probably a country girl. <laughs> That's it. We're going to need to hear more about the Willow <laughs> I'm Bobby Weber on a day job. I do research at uh, Oregon State University <coughs> on children and their life. And um, the, um, my, uh, my mother, we didn't have kindergarten, so um, my mother popped up. And plus, she, I would agree with all the, my first teacher, my last teacher. Um, 
most important <coughs> intern. And, um, but uh, my uh, first grade teacher was Sister Stanislaus, and she was aided by my aunt, Sister Josepha. <laughs> and um, I, I think I'll, this is embarrassing, but I'll share this story, because I think it's pretty typical of young kids. Anyway, I didn't uh, like to be uh, reprimanded, and so the, and in those days they sent you to the corner and um so they sent me to the corner and so i licked the lines off the chalkboard all the way from my desk to the corner oh, this is a new side of you Bob. Yeah. <laughs> i would have never thought that of you i can't talk that <laughs> I'm Dana Harganani. I'm um, a pediatrician and in my full-time day job now work as the Child Health Director for the Oregon Health Authority. I'm pleased to be here. I, I don't have any really good stories. My first, <laughs> certainly my first teacher is strong memories of my parents' role in my life, um, but I had a fantastic preschool for several years before kindergarten called Learning to Learn, and I think just the name itself is a strong memory and, and what I learned there. Um, I'm Jim Tierney. Uh, I run a three-county uh, rural anti-poverty program in Northwest Oregon. We have Head Start in our agency. Um, I would uh, say that uh, uh, my first <coughs> teacher that I would remember, let me, let me put in a plug for fathers. Uh, in my house, my father did the reading to the kids. Uh, but my mother was certainly deserved all the accolades the rest of you have given. <laughs> um, and the teacher I would point out is my kindergarten teacher, Sister Mary Elephants, who I recalled Elephant, Sister Mary Elephant, in <laughs> reference to your tie. And the last thing I would add is Jada's has only stepped in one cow pie. She needs to get out into more pastures. <laughs> I just talked about my first one. <laughs> Um, I'm Lynn Saxton. In my day job, I'm executive director of Youth Villages. We work with severely emotionally and behaviorally disturbed children from around the state, um, both in residential care and in their homes. Um, my first teacher was uh, actually it was my parents, so my mother taught us and me to always have a book in my hand, and to this day, I would never travel without books or am never anywhere without a book. And my father taught um, us sports at a at a very young age we were playing basketball which is a strong memory um, best teachers I can name like eight of my Portland public school teachers remarkable teachers but my favorite um, and most inspirational perhaps was mr. Goddard who threw erasers <coughs> to sand in those days <laughs> and um, there was not a child in his class or a kid in his class who didn't get out with excellent math skills, even if they hated math. He was a <coughs> wizard of education. I'm Terry Tolifer, and in my 24-hour day job, I'm the director of North Central Public Health District. Um, we're the only multi-county public health district in Oregon serving Wasco, Sherman, and Gillum counties. And uh, along, I guess us early learners are honoring the parents. Uh, my parents were definitely my first teachers, but I want to call out my dad who quit school at 13 years old because a teacher in Pasco told him he was stupid and probably has a learning disability, doesn't like to read, um, and even with that struggle was always the reader at home. So he, um, he was the guy that pulled out the doctor suits because I'm sure my mom was cleaning something at night <laughs> when there was uh, reading, but I just um, really appreciate still to this day that as difficult as it was for him, that um, he, he read the stories and he did the same for his grandkids. So that was pretty amazing. And I, he uh, went to work on his own at a dairy on Sovies Island and the owner of the dairy made him finish eighth grade mm -hmm. and uh, did pretty well for himself for that. But uh, just look in a couple generations how the world has changed so significantly. Thank you all for sharing. Um, Mark? <coughs> I just want to, before we kick, it, kick in, I want to make sure and introduce Marla Royal. She's my assistant. And if you need anything throughout the day, she's the one. Our office is right here. I know tech comes in and out. 
and issues happen. So Marlo's the contact for that. If you need anything today, I just want to make sure you do. So I'll just take the moment. We uh, have a just. There's no way we can say thank you for uh, in, in the uh, amount in which it's deserved for both you and Marla, but we do have a card just to uh, indicate a little bit of our appreciation for all of the work you Boy, have done. Boy, that is really proactive. <laughs> that is proactive. We'll see at the end of the day if we still deserve it. But <laughs> right. I do want to contribute my story. Recently, I just my 89-year-old mother gave me my oh. kindergarten report card. Oh. <laughs> oh. which in 1970 was pretty fascinating to see how they scored but it was a pretty good report card nice kid doing pretty well but it did say a couple things significant issues with handwriting and questions about se verbal self-control <laughs> what a note to end on <laughs> Well, we want to thank all, we're going to have you introduce yourselves to each other at some point. <coughs> um, but uh, we thought it was really important to have a chance for us to have a little bit of interpersonal uh, uh, interaction and dialogue. Who's on the phone now? Or? I think we at least have Dick on the phone. Dick, are you there? Yes, uh huh. Great. Do you want to introduce yourself? Well, I'm more curious whether Mark has his Dodge, Dodge t shirt on or not. <laughs> He does not. He has a tie. He's too small. I need a larger size, Dick. He's, he says he, he needs a bigger size. He needs a bigger size, Dick. Uh, I'm still waiting for that uh, 76 Dodge Dart, the red one, to pull up in my <laughs> driveway yeah. while, while he's lobbying for things. Right. I heard most of the introductions, I guess, for I think with Mel and retired business guy. But uh, hey, when you, when you we're, we're going around the room talking about your early uh, childhood teachers. I can remember my first grade teacher about the third day. It was, I went to school at Luke Clark Consolidated outside of uh, Astoria in Jefferson Gardens, which was uh, kind of a military deal after World War II. And uh, I remember about the third day that I was acting up and I got a little bit of swat on the back end and I went home and told my parents and then I got another swat. So I got <laughs> Sounds like reinforcement, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> Pam, you want to? Yeah. Did we have anybody else on the phone? Marlene or uh, Harriet, are you there? Okay. We expect uh, participation uh, for uh, of uh, early learning <coughs> council members Marlene Yesquin and Harriet Adair by phone. And then I just wanted to take the opportunity to announce for those of you that didn't know. Um, neither Charles McGee nor Sorolda will be able to participate in the meetings today. Sorolda was in a car accident. Uh, she was rear-ended by a drunk driver. Um, and because she's pregnant, she spent a couple of days in the hospital, but she went home yesterday or day before. Uh, and so they, he's taken good care of her at home, and uh, neither will be participating in our meeting today. And that, that's unfortunate because some of the topics that we have on both the agenda for the Early Learning Council and the board are, are, are topics of great importance and interest to both of them. So um, if you have a chance to send up a good wish uh, for Charles and Sorilda, but it sounds like everything's going okay now. A little complication, but everything's okay now. So, um, okay. So uh, with that, I um, want to introduce, uh, Sam and I are going to take turns going back and forth uh, on the agenda. And we have a really interesting opportunity to hear from Dr. Kent Thornburg this morning. And uh, for those of you that are on the phone, we'll switch the polycom so that you'll be able to hear Dr. Thornburg's presentation. So Kent is a colleague of mine at OHSU, and he has been involved for some time now, several decades, in some fascinating research um, that's, I think, um, just now starting, um, although it should have been, <clears throat> we should all know about it, but it's just now starting to really get the light of day. <coughs> and it's fascinating research about the underpinnings of children's ability to learn. Um, we're all quite familiar with the brain research that's gotten a lot of popularity and press, um, deservedly so in the last uh, 30 or so years. This is a slightly different twist on that information, and it's uh, critically important to the work of both boards. So we asked Dr. Thornburg to come and uh, make a presentation to just get us up to speed and familiar with what's going on, and again, really important underpinnings for all of our work. So I'm going to shift uh, so that you all can see, and we'll shift the polycom, and um, I'll just let Ken take it. And while she's sitting down, I'll just point out to, I'll just point out to you that there are five or six institutes at the National Institute of Health that have supported me over my whole career. 
and I owe them a lot. The National Institute of Health has been extremely generous, including all of these <coughs> institutes, the Murdoch Trust and the Edwards <coughs> uh, Next slide, please. So here's what I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to do it very rapidly. One is the good news about what's happened in heart disease because it's an example of how uh, some things in medicine have really worked. Then I want to talk to you about the bad news about the health of Americans and especially people in Oregon. I'm going to say why do we believe that some people are really vulnerable for chronic diseases like heart disease. And then I want to talk about where epigenetics fits with this. And then I want to talk about what, if, what about people who are vulnerable and what does that have to do with children that are growing up. So I want to stress this point before we start, and that is that many times when I talk about the role of nutrition that passes across generation, inevitably a question I get from some woman in the audience is, why are we blaming women for all the diseases in the world? And the truth is we don't. But what we are blaming is in the environment that we live in and I just want to make this point to start with, that all of us live in an environment, we inhale the air of our environment and we live in it and we interact with it. And then we, we have a food environment that we live in. And even though most of us think that we're really good at our choices about food and we eat the way we want, as a culture we all eat pretty much the same. So when we look across the nutrition, the nutritional culture that we live in, those are the issues we think about and this is the culture we live in. And this affects what mothers eat and the kind of nutrition they have had across the generations and how they grow their babies. Next slide. So here are two different babies. There's a girl on the left and a little boy on the right. These were born in Southampton, United Kingdom, where uh, a colleague of mine took the picture. Now the important part about these two babies is that they have very different lives. And we can predict their health risks based on their body composition when they're born. This baby boy is thin and short, and this baby girl is long for a girl, which are usually shorter, and she has a lot more muscle. She'll, have, she'll be mus much less likely to have diseases later in her life than this boy will have. Next slide. So in order to get the context about how disease works and how it fits within our own community, I just want to show you where we fit in the world. It turns out that these are deaths from heart disease, and you can see that most of the deaths in, in heart disease in 2004 or 2005 were in the old Soviet Union countries, and they still have the highest rates in the world. And when you look across the United States, you can see that it's at the low end of the heart disease rate. It's pretty interesting, though, that cardiovascular <coughs> disease, that's heart disease and stroke, still kills more people than anybody else or any other disease. And it turns out that countries like Canada and, New and Mexico, were on each side of us, have much lower rates of heart disease than we have. And we think we understand why that's true. And just to make you feel good about the United States, I want you to know that anybody who moves from Mexico to the United States within two generations has the same disease rates that we do. Next slide. So here's the good news. Starting in 1900, you can see that deaths from heart disease went up dramatically. Most people don't know this, but there's virtually no heart disease in the United States at the turn of the last century. And that increased over time up until the past World War II. And starting in 1968, it started going down. It's been going down ever since, and this doesn't show it as far as it goes down. There's been about a 60% reduction in heart disease in the last 30 years. And that's been a very interest. that is a 30% reduction in the number of deaths from heart disease. And I'll talk to you about that if you're interested about why that occurred. But it turns out that one of the reasons is that people have uh, different ways of eating and many people, especially well-educated people, take better care of themselves than they did before. Next slide. This shows for both <coughs> men and women, it started going down sooner for men than women. And in about the early 2000s, it started going down for women, and their decreases in deaths from heart disease have really gone down rapidly in the last 20 years, something we're very proud of. Next slide. And uh, go to the next slide. I just showed those. So now I want to tell you the bad news. I've been excited to do this. Next slide. <laughs> so what you really need to know is that in the United States of America, we have seen the fastest rise in chronic disease ever in the history of any nation that's been documented that I can find. And I can just give you a few examples of how that works. One is obesity has doubled between 1989 and 2007. 
and that number is still very high, and it's a record high. There have never been these kinds of numbers in any society in the world before. You should say that diabetes has been going up. This is 1958, this is 2010, and you can see that there was less than 1% of diabetes in 2008, and I'm one of the people in this room that can remember 1958. I don't know how many people can remember that year, but if you can, and you were in school like I was, you would not have met another kid that had diabetes because those kids that had diabetes were pretty rare and they were almost all genetic forms of it. Now, diabetes has gone up so that now 8% of our whole society has diabetes and the CDC tells us that if this slope, which started going up in the 1990s at a very steep rate at the same time obesity went up, if this slope keeps going up, one in three people will have diabetes in the United States by 2050. And they're saying that if this happens, then we have to completely rethink about healthcare and how we operate as a society for taking care of people. So these are things you might have heard of, you knew these things are going up, but I want to point out that something happened in the mid 90s to make this go up really fast. And here are the number of people who have uncontrolled blood pressure, and these people with blood pressure are people who, who, many of whom have had their blood pressure measured, but are not have, being taken care of. And with our poor insurance systems in the United States, most of these people are people that are outside the reach of our insurance possibilities. So these are people that are left in the dust and not being cared for. And what's sad about this is the American Heart Association went on a campaign in the late 90s to tell people to get their blood pressure measured to see if we could reduce the incidence of heart disease because of that. And the interesting thing is that when they went back to measure it, they found out it had gone up, it didn't go down. So our publicity campaign probably did help some people, but the number of people that were being dropped out of the system increased even more. And this is documented in this New England Journal of Art Medicine article that's very important landmark for telling how public policy works and how we can work on, on diseases. Then lastly, this chart shows you that birth weights have been going down since 1990. This <coughs> decrease in the average birth weight surprises people, and I always get pushback on it, because people know that there are more mothers now that are delivering who are obese than ever before. And by the way, at OHSU, now about half of all the women who deliver their babies there are obese. They have a body mass index over 30. And that turns out to push the increase in the number of babies that are born heavy because many of these women don't have good glucose control and their diabetic state will allow glucose to go across the placenta and make a bigger baby. So this is happening in spite of the fact that there is now a proportion among a part of the population that's having larger babies. This is being, drift, this is being driven by ethnic groups and particularly I'm concerned about the African American population which continues to have smaller and smaller babies and not larger ones. Now, I want to show you, I'm sure you've seen these slides before, but I can't, if I can only drive one point home, I want to tell you what's happened in 20 some years of time to the health <coughs> of Americans. And if you don't understand this, you won't understand why we are in the acute phase of a disease epidemic, and why would I talk to a group like this who's, who, who <coughs> I am, I'm honoring here today for the work that's being done among children. And the reason I bring it up is twofold. One is that the costs associated with chronic disease that is going up in our country will divert funds and resources that will be needed to take care of people away from all kinds of things that we need for the next generation. So I'm very concerned about that side of it. And the next point is that what I'm going to show you about health changes also <coughs> reflects on the way babies are developing their brains and their likelihood for doing well in school later. And that's the point I want to make in my talk today. So I'm just going to run through these slides. I have a series of slides of you, the map of the United States that you can get from the CDC. But if you haven't seen these recently, you need to see them. I need to see them over and over to, to understand what's happening. <coughs> here, this is 1989. You can see that across the United States, the percentage of people who, have, who are uh, defined as obese, 
who have a body mass index over 30. That is your weight for your height ratio. And it turns out that back in 1989, a few states were recalcitrant and they wouldn't submit their data to the CDC, so they're white. But all the others, you can see the color, and you can see that the highest percentage in any state among which was Oregon is at 14%. So now we're gonna go through these slides. If you'll just do the next slide. There is 1990, next slide. There's 1992, and now there's a new category, 15 to 19%, next slide. 1993, next slide. 1995, next slide. 97, new category, now percentage is over 20%. Next slide. Now over 20%, 99, next slide. 2001, new category, over 25%. Next slide. 2002, next slide. 2003, next slide. 2004, next slide. 2005, next slide, new category, over 30%. You can see the, these two states in the south, which always lead the way. And you can also see Colorado. By the way, this is not a political map. This is a map that has to do with obesity. Next slide. Next slide. Now you can see Oregon joined those that have over 25% and was heading toward 30 in 2007. Next slide. 2009. Next slide. 2010. <coughs> Next slide. Last year, 2012, they redid all the colors in the maps because they ran out of the color system and they decided to start again. And now you can see that there's a new category, over 35%, and that's because Louisiana is just about to step into the 35% range. We expect that to happen during this year. So here's the, this is the point that's happened, and you can see that over a short time frame, the health of Americans has done worse if you use this as an indicator, and there are many other indicators that I could use. Next slide. So now you've seen the bad news, you should, be, you should feel cheered. <laughs> and I want to talk to you a little bit about why people are vulnerable and what that has to do with developing brains. Next slide. So this is a slide from David Barker. David Barker showed these data in 1989 for the first time. And what he showed that is a person's risk for dying of heart disease was dependent on this population in England on how, you, how much a person weighed when they were born. And it turns out that babies at the nine pound range, <coughs> nine pounds had very low risk, but that risk increased rapidly up to three to five times higher for babies that were born at the five pound range. And as you can see, there's a gradation. This is not just a very small baby has this problem, that the risk is graded. And you can also see that David Barker didn't know this when he first found this, but we've found it since, that this curve goes <coughs> upward very rapidly and a lot of the babies I mentioned earlier that are called macrosomic, that are now born at this very high range, <coughs> are suffering the same kinds of disease risk as the babies that are at the low range. Next slide. Here's the risk for diabetes, and it's even more striking. Here's an eight times higher risk for babies born at the five pound range than mm. babies born at the nine pound range. And this risk now has been shown uh, for a lot of different countries. I, now, that I've, now that you've seen these two slides, I just want to make the point that this was not a quirk that happened in England. That was the first place it was shown. The next group to look at it was the United States. We looked at it in the American Nurses Study, and we found exactly the same slope that we found in England. It's now been repeated in seven countries, including in Can Scandinavia countries, China, and India. And it doesn't matter which ethnic group you talk about, the risks for human beings all land on the same curve. So a five pound baby, a four pound baby born in India has the same risks for having those diseases in their life as a baby in the United States. Next slide, please. So now I wanna tell something about the complication of this. A lot of people ask me, well, if this happens when you're born, does that mean you're gonna get the disease? The answer is no. What it means if you're born at a low birth weight or a really high birth weight, that you're vulnerable for having the disease. Vulnerability means that you're in a risk category. And whether you get the disease depends on a lot of things and by a concept we call the second hit. The second hit means that you might be vulnerable, 
But the, the determinant of whether you will actually get these diseases when you're older will depend more on what happens to you later in your life if you are vulnerable. It also means that if you're not vulnerable, you won't be sensitive to a second hit. So we went back and we looked at boys and girls to find out how they grew during their childhood to find out whether it was likely that they would get disease. And we took people who had disease and we went back and looked at what happened to them. So now these graphs, if you're not looking at not used to looking at epidemiology graphs, might be hard for you. So let me explain how to, how to study them. This is what's called a Z-score or a standard deviation score. And all you have to know is that all the boys in the cohort, of which there were 4,000, those that got heart disease are shown in these graphs down here. But all the rest of the population is at this zero line. And what that means is that as they grew up in age, I'm plotting age along the bottom here, the first, 12, the first uh, two years of life, 24 months of life, and then years of life. So here's the first two years of life here. Those that didn't get the disease stayed on their cohort. That is, if they were in the 15th percentile of their weight, they stayed at that weight through their life as they grew up. The kid, the the, the kids, the boys that got heart disease actually, were well below the average cohort. Their birth weight, their height, and their BMI were low when they were born, and it stayed low through their first two years of life. But the interesting part of this is that they put on weight starting at the age of four, and that weight was in the form of fat that increased their BMI so that they actually, by the time they were 10 years old, they were the average weight for their cohort. But they had put on that weight rapidly late in their child, I mean early in their childhood. Now here's what happened for girls, it's very similar. It's different in one respect. And that is for girls, they put on weight starting at the age of five like the boys did, but they didn't, they surpassed their cohort and they put on weight at a high rate. And we're seeing that this is particularly true in ethnic groups, Hispanic and Af people of African descent, they tend to put on a lot more weight in childhood. And African girls are starting their periods earlier now, earlier and earlier and earlier, sometimes as early as eight or nine years old. And they're doing that because they're putting on weight and this fat makes estrogen and kicks in their HPA axis so that they actually start uh, their reproduction patterns earlier in their life. We're very concerned about this trend. Yeah. This is the pattern that we now see is predictive of having these diseases later in life. Next slide. This is going to cost us money. In 2014, we spend $1.3 billion a day on cardiovascular disease alone. It's the most expensive disease. And what the CDC and the American Heart Association is predicting, that when we get out by 2030, this will be three times what it is now and we no longer will be able to afford to give the kind of care that we're putting, giving people now based on the predictions. And this curve is being driven by the number of increases of people who have diabetes. Next slide. So just to tell you something about how this works, I wanna make the point about stroke because stroke has to do with the way the structures around the brain are being formed. So the risk of stroke and of heart disease are both from low birth weight babies. I've just shown you that people that get cardiovascular disease put on fat when they're children. And that they ha I didn't talk to you about it, but they also have abnormal placentas. However, people with stroke have low birth weight and they grow or actually lose centiles during their childhood. And these are kids, these are kids that, that have inadequate access to calories at the time when they're building their brain structures and they have poor childhood growth of their mothers, and it turns out that the mother's growth, poor growth, is passed on to the children, even if the children have access to good nutrition. Next slide, please. So there have been several studies, I'm gonna show you four slides now, that give you evidence that the way you grow before you're born has a lot to do with your ability of your brain to be able to function later in its life. Here's the body mass index of men <coughs> in Finland who were, uh, joining the military and they had to take tests for their mental capacity. And we went back and looked at those records and what we found was that 
the body mass index at birth, or their weight at birth, you could say, predicted how they did on their scores when they were 20 years old. The lowest, the lowest birth weights had the worst scores, the highest birth weight had the highest scores. Next slide. We started looking at um, the kinds of issues that have to do with psychiatric disorders, and we found there's a very strong birth weight effect for psychiatric disorders. I'm just gonna show you one here. One of the big ones is, is schizophrenia, but another one has to do with depression. <coughs> and here it shows you depression <coughs> in boys and girls, depending on their birth weight. And you can see that at the time of puberty, girls have high rates of depression compared to boys if they were born at low birth weight or compared to other girls that were born at normal birth weight or higher. Next slide. And now I'm just going to give you a list of studies that we've done that, uh, that we've done on people in, from the Helsinki birth cohort. And this Helsinki group, I don't know if you know this, but the Scandinavians keep records on all their medical records across generations. So if you want to know something about how health works across generations, you can talk to the Finns. And the Finns have done a good job. And I'm just going to show, I'm going to read these to you. First of all, Early life origins of cognitive decline among elderly men in Helsinki, and there we discovered men who were born at low birth weight, they live shorter lives and they have more cognitive decline starting earlier in life. Fetal programming of temperamental negative affectivity, this is a psychiatric term about the affect of children born, and it turns out even if they were born healthy, those with low birth weight had, had more often difficulties with aff affectivity. Very low birth weight and behavioral symptoms for attention deficit disorders. There we found that very low birth weight babies have very high rates of having attention deficit disorders. And we think that's a nutritional effect. We're studying that at OHSU. <coughs> Growth trajectories and intellectual abilities in young adulthood. And I just want you to know that this is again back for the men who, who were in the military. We found that small head circumference at birth predicted four verbal, spatial, and arithmetic abilities. And I'll just put it bluntly, your head size at two years predicted your IQ when you were 20 in that group. And that, was, that helped us to understand how, these, how the growth of the babies in their first two years of life would make a difference. <coughs> Prenatal br gr brain growth and linear growth in the first two, year li two, first two years of life was a critical window for intellectual development. Another one was clearly found between the ages of two and seven. And that means that these nutritional opportunities for the brain are really important because those are the times, especially when they get omega-3 <coughs> fatty acids, that they need to build brain circuits is the time that they will use those nutrients to do well. And if they don't have those, they can never go back. The brain cannot be fixed in an eight-year-old that wasn't grown right in a two-year-old. So that's the important point about this is that the nutrition is, is in that part of it is not reversible. Next slide. So I'll go through quickly. So how do we get big babies or babies that have good brains? Mom's nutrition, her diet, that means that young girls have to have good bodies when they get pregnant. Next slide. Chronic social stress is just as important as nutritional stress. Chronic social stress is the bane of people who live in poor circumstances because it causes the hormone cortisol to go up in the mother that crosses the placenta and suppresses the growth of the baby so that the baby is grown, born small. And a baby that's born small in poor social circumstances might be because of poor nutrition it might be because high stress levels in the mother, or it might be because of both. And in that case, those babies ha have a very poor start in life because they have a lot to make up for in terms of building their bodies. Next slide, please. So this is a harder part for people to understand, and this is the transgenerational nutritional flow. And this means that we have to think more carefully about having quick fixes for things because our nutrition across generation is what makes a difference in terms of how healthy our population is going to be. So all of us sitting in this room are products of mothers 
we learned from our mothers we heard from this morning and by the way both of my parents were teachers so <laughs> I, I had the thing I grew up in a teacher family it turns out that what we now know is that the population of an entire group of people like in the state of Oregon is due to the nutrition of mothers and the way those mothers grew up and passed that on to the next generation so I'm going to give myself an example of this and I'm the perfect example because this is what we call the hundred year effect and I'm in my 60s. My mother, who's still alive, is in her 90s. And the egg that made me in her ovary was made when she was in my grandmother's womb. Because that's when eggs are laid down and when her ovary was made. The egg that made me in my mother's ovary was made almost exactly 100 years ago. That makes me 100 years old. I'm 100 years old because the nutrition that affects the health that I have now and my risk for disease were caused by my grandmother. So here's a young woman who someday will be a grandmother. She has this baby, and that baby's making its ovaries, and by the way, its other reproductive organs, they're also affected by this nutrition, and that, that will matter on how well she can support a baby <coughs> later. That baby girl there will become this mother, and this is her body, and she's growing her baby, and that baby came from that egg that was put in that ovary, when it was nourished by that mother. So it turns out that the nutrition that flows across generation changes the genetic regulation of genes in the egg that start and carry on for two generations. And we've only discovered this in the last dozen years. It's now a fact. We don't worry about telling people about it because it's been reproduced so many times. And if this is such a deep biological finding it can be done in any animal study. And when we went back and started talking in Australia, we talked to a bunch of farmers and they said, well, we've known about that for 100 years. <laughs> we, we put our animals on good pasture in order to make sure that their eggs are good before we breed them. Mm -hmm. We, you humans aren't very smart. So <laughs> it turns out that this has been known a long time. Next slide, please. So what's the epigenetics have to do with it? Next slide. <coughs> And that is that we have to know whether this is genetic or not. And I just want to, in the interest of time, not make a, a lot of argument here. But I just want to tell you, it's not genetic. Most people are born with normal genes. But those genes can be modified by nutrients before you're born. And here you can see heart deaths. You can see the darker red means that there are more heart deaths. And by the way, Louisiana and Mississippi has the same heart death rates that I showed you at the beginning for the Soviet countries. So the range of heart deaths across different regions of the United States ranges by five to six fold. And it turns out that in the Deep South, that's high stroke deaths, de people with diabetes, obesity, and now I want to point out that the poverty, of rural poverty in America could be found in the same regions. And we believe, but we have not yet proven, that this poverty is due to the aftermath of the Civil War. And because of the Civil War, the ability to raise good nutritious food and to have good diets has been reduced for 150 years in America. And the price we're paying now for are the disease rates that you see in these regions. So if you want to make a genetic argument, and some scientists still do, you have to argue that all the bad genes for heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and obesity are all found in people in the South. We don't buy it. This is clearly a very environmental effect. Next slide, please. Yeah. How does epigenetics work? It works by the chemical <coughs> modification of DNA. If you're not a scientist, you don't, might not know that that's a strand of DNA. And DNA is just nothing but a, all the genes in your body are just a long string of DNA on your chromosomes. And those genes are turned off and on <coughs> by little regions called promoters that are at the beginning of the gene. And you can suppress those promoters by changing the chemical composition of the components of the DNA so that they can't turn off <coughs> and on very well. And that's done by what we call methylation. This methylation is a carbon and three hydrogens that's added on certain parts of the DNA molecule, and that leads to silencing again. We've only known this for 20 years. So now that we know about this, we're starting to realize that epigenetic effects of diet before we were born modify the way our bodies are going to grow for the rest of our life. 
and to be the sad part of it is that in extreme cases this gets passed on to the next generation because it affects the genes in the germ cell line in eggs and sperm. Here's two identical twins. These girls have different fingerprints even though their genes are alike because they grew differently in the womb because they get different amounts of nutrition. Here's two genetically identical mice. They look different and this mouse will live a much shorter life than that even though it has the same genes because its mother had a poor diet and that poor diet silenced the genes that were needed to keep the animal from <coughs> having obesity. So this is an obese mouse that will live only one third as long as that one. Genetically identical. This is, I'm just driving the point home here. The problem that we have is not that we inherit bad genes from our parents, it's that we have modified those genes in the last three generations and we believe that's the reason that heart disease and diabetes is going up at such a fast rate. I'm going to show you an example of an epigenetic wow. effect. Next slide. So this is the hopeful thing. Animal experiments show that with good diets, some of the epigenetic effects can be reversed. And we think we're going to figure out a way to learn to do that. And I hope we can use nutrition to do it by using specific nutrients that will modify genes the way they were once modified early in our life. Next slide, please. Here's the proof of the pudding. This is methylation. These bars represent the amount of methylation in white blood cells of children based on a specific gene that's been methylated by the mother's diet. And in this case, the amount of carbohydrate that the mother ate. Very low amounts of carbohydrate in pregnancy cause methylation of this gene. Here's the children's fat mass by a DEXA exam. There's no question that these are the right numbers and as a percentage of the body weight. This has been reproduced in two different places and they found exactly the same thing. And that means that the amount that this gene is methylated by the mother's diet predicts how fat the child will be when they put on weight at the age of seven. And as I just told you early, putting on weight at this amount of time is really important. Now you're asking me, I'm sure, what, how does this all work? And what I didn't tell you is that the way you grow before you're born is what wires your brain for appetite. Why are these babies getting fatter? They're getting fatter because their brain is different. This is just a rough marker of something that happened in the brain that wires the appetite for eating food. Now, if you see somebody that's overweight and you think, well, that person may be not very disciplined because they have a lot of weight. If they were like me, they'd be thin. It turns out that if you had their brain, you would look like they do. Because it turns out that the way we eat is dependent on the way our brain was made early in their life. And I have family members who struggle with weight. We all grew up together, and I know exactly how this works. Yeah, next slide. So what's our food culture got to do with it? Here's an extreme example. <laughs> this is the Heart Attack Grill. And by the way, you can go to it. There are three of them. One's in Las Vegas. And it turns out that they have four burgers ranging from the single bypass to the quadruple bypass <laughs> burger. And this burger, if you eat this, this joke cola, and they'll throw in the cigarettes, by the way, and have flat liner fries, it's 8,000 calories. So you can get full. And it turns out that they have their waitresses in nurses' outfits that smoke. And this is kind of a, a, an interesting uh, backlash to the American health food culture, right? I find it funny, but it's not too funny in that in a separate website, I found out that their chief spokesman died of a heart attack. Mm. And I expect that he had this burger on the day before. <laughs> so this is an indicator that we Americans live in a terrible food culture. And unless we change it, we're not going to be able to take care of all the people who are going to get sick in our society. And those resources will not be available for us to take care of our children. Next slide. It's back to the environment we live in, and the nutritional food culture we're in is the most important <coughs> environment that we need to change. Next slide. And lastly, I want to make these points. I want to make the point that if you want to prove the health of Oregon's children, it's going to require the following. Improving the diets and bodies of young women, that's a must, because a woman's body determines how well she can support a pregnancy. Secondly, we need to raise the status of women's health so that we can discuss this 
among our school people, <coughs> our children who are eating in our cafeterias, and the girls that are growing up. And I, like I said before, I'm an authority on this because my wife was a sixth grade teacher for 20 years, and she taught me about the girls in her class and the struggles they have with eating well. We have to reduce social and nutrition stress because stress is equally important, and mothers who are pregnant and don't, don't know where their pay paycheck's gonna come from, can't buy good, new, good food for their children, are under stress, and that stress by itself is suppressing the growth of their babies. Nutritional, emotional care for infants and children is something we have to do, and is something I know that the people in this room are deeply concerned about. And I just wanna make this bold statement we should not even expect any large scale, scale improvements in learning and social behaviors, even with interventions, without improving the quality of our children's brains. And we can only do that by following this formula that's very clear now about where we have to go. And I just want you to know on Monday, I'm flying to Washington, and I'm going to participate in a, in a conference that goes four days with the National Institute of Health. And we're going to discuss what we might be able to do this on a national level. Thank you for your time. Council of board members, uh, we're going to take a few minutes to ask questions of uh, Dr. Thornburg or, uh, you know, push him a little bit, challenge him if you'd like about uh, this. Uh, work that he's been about, and, and then we want to have a little bit of a conversation about what implications we think this has for the work that we do. So, um, first council and board members, questions or comments? So I have one, um, doctor. Um, I'm Angela Bowen, and um, you ta it talked about methylation on here, and I think about um, the high rates of uh, obesity and the diet industry and how you talked about um, very specific nutrition in order to possibly um, help repair um, the chromosomes. Um, what are your thoughts about how we would um, go about that and how, um, how are we gonna get away from that diet industry situation where people are starving themselves <coughs> again yeah. and causing um, yeah. uh, cyclic patterns of um, hurting our chromosomes. Yeah, this is a, um, this, if we're gonna do anything positive, it's not gonna be easy. And the difficulties are largely found in, in our food industry. The food industry and also the diet book industry. Both of those are causing us harm. Almost all the books written about diets that you can eat and lose weight are harmful. It doesn't matter if it's the Atkins diet or if it's the, the green brain diet, which is the new one. All of, all of these are harmful. <coughs> the, the, the rules for eating a good diet are very, very simple. And those are eat fruits and vegetables, nuts, grains, and beans. If you eat mostly those and get all of your food from those, and I would throw fish in with it, you will have a complete diet and you don't need a diet book. If you eat those healthy things all the time, you'll, you'll give your body all the nutrients it needs. And that very simple message can be taught to children. And it should be a simple rule for all the food that our kids eat at school. And it should be, it, what we need to do is help find ways that people can eat this way in their own homes. But we have a big problem because the diet industry, because of the way we have eaten over the last 30 years, a lot of us have more weight than we want. And because of that, we resort to these diets and, we, and people who write these books make millions and millions and millions of dollars and they're driven to do it. And the, I've met some of these people in Miami because a few years ago, the South Beach diet people asked me to come and they wanted, to, wanted me to franchise this and uh, allow them to include it in their next book and they would pay me a lot of money. So it turns out that there's a lot of demand for this kind of thing and I won't have anything to do with it because I want to see a, a society that can break the circle of depending on these diet books. Oh, I Bob, just, did you? 
Yeah, it's sort of probably a technical question, but you start. You talked a little bit about um, carbohydrate. Yeah. Um, just real very briefly, and I was curious about. Um, you, you didn't really extend on uh, how the carbohydrate played a role, so I was right. wondering what that was. Well, so I gave a I gave a really whirlwind view of the whole thing, but what you need to know is that a balanced diet. The word balance means balanced carbohydrates, fats, and protein. And a balanced diet is a healthy diet. If you eat approximately equal amounts of those three, you'll have a healthy diet. It turns out that people who try to cut fat out of their diet because industry started making fat-free food when they found out the American Heart Association was asking people to reduce the amount of fat because many people in our society were eating about 50% of their calories as fat back in about the early 1980s. So the American Heart Association came out with the thing, you should, you'll should you have a better diet if you cut out your fat. Well, the industry then started making low-fat, high-carb diet foods in their prepared foods, and people started eating carbs. And they ate carbs like you wouldn't believe, and they put on a lot of weight because of it. And by the way, you should know, that during that time, as the fat went down, heart disease went down too. So the Heart Association wasn't didn't have it all wrong. But we all got fat during that time, and we're still on that roll. Now, the women who had very low-carb diets, these are women that are on the equivalent of the Atkins diet. They cause their kids the most harm because high-fat, high-protein diets, low in carb, cause the methylation that I showed you there. And that's a sure-fire thing that their children are going to put on weight after they're born. Yeah. Yes, Dick, and then we'll go to Norm. <clears throat> Go ahead. So am I, am I yeah, up? You're up. Okay. Uh, Pam, I, I, would, I would just, uh, first of all, it's, it's one of those aha experiences, the very deep, uh, knowledge that uh, I think we should really elevate the importance of health to our to the education. And I, I wonder if it's, if it's possible to consider getting, uh, I'm an anti-committee, but uh, getting a, a group of people together in the, uh, the OAIB and the ELC and and, and education board to look at this as a business model for the return on investment <coughs> is very significant on uh, lack of knowledge or common knowledge to the, to the uh, particularly to the business community and why they should get behind this. I'm alongside of, uh, of Dr. Thornburg's work he's done to get in front of the Chamber of Commerce and the other business community to actually this knowledge and uh, what we're really talking about is not so much. I mean, he's got the uh, got the uh, <coughs> the uh, research. We're talking about sweat equity on getting the knowledge out to the community as a whole. And what a win-win in mean, healthier people, but then also touching point the uh, the education. I mean, so I, I would recommend that possibly we could form just maybe a ninety or a, or by twelve thirty-one or something to come back to how we could really using the word impregnate the state of Oregon on this knowledge and do something about it. I think the return on investment would really be significant. Great. Thank you. I'm going to make a note of that. We're going to talk in just a few minutes about what implications there are and what the boards may want to do with this. Uh, but we'll, we'll see if there are other questions. Um, so, Norm, did you have a question? Uh, could you just tell me uh, methylation means? Right. So. In chemistry, a methyl group is a carbon that has three hydrogens attached to it. And ordinarily, that, that group of molecules are not attached to DNA. And there are some genes that there is now, there are enzymes in the body that can attach this methylation to a gene, and that will slow down the way that that gene can work. So that's, that's what methylation means. Short follow up. Uh, very impressive uh, presentation as you advance through the slides and uh, show the consequences uh, of health in, in the United States. What is your prediction that we could see those slides change radically in the other direction? Well, I firmly believe, or I wouldn't even be, be here. I mean, I'm a lab guy. I'd be at home in my laboratory. I firmly believe that as a society, we can now discuss the eradication of chronic disease. Other countries have done it. France did this at the turn of the last century. 
So good diets make impressive, rapid change in a society, but the diseases don't disappear for two generations. So we have to decide as a society whether or not we want to go to the amazing amount of effort that it will require to change our food culture. If we decide to do it, we can do it. I believe that in the American spirit. But I also think that we, you better count the cost because you're against an industry that I've heard is only second to the pornography interest in, in industry in making money. So I think, I think that this is a difficult thing. Uh, Madam Chair. Please, Norm, and then we'll go to Terry. Just small irony. Uh, Jada and I were standing in the back of the room. We stopped and got our coffee only uh, you know, for breakfast on the way here this morning. And I just threw the receipts in the trash can. And as I was doing that, we were hearing this presentation. I looked down. And the two Starbucks receipts at Safeway had four free Whopper certificates on the back side mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we mm -hmm. could all go out to lunch later today. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Terry. I just like your thoughts. I have concern that when we look at those graphs and we look at the people in poverty, that um, when we start to talk about policy change, what we're going to hear is those people need to make better choices and not a real acknowledgement that um, state and federal policy really doesn't allow them an environment in which to make the right choices. S that, you know, the, the filling in a Pop-Tart is not a fruit. And um, I, 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 there's a lot of victim blaming in this country around these sorts of choices. Um, and I, I just, I, I have real concern that when we talk about, we have to talk about creating an environment in which and, and that the healthy choice is the easy choice instead of the, um, the processed food being what's easy for families to obtain. I like that. Lynn? So I'm confused, and, and this is a serious question, and so I've, I'm willing to embarrass myself. What is the difference between grains and carbohydrates? So I thought carbohydrates were bread and grains and stuff. And so are you saying, specific, when you say grains are key, what are the grains that are key? <clears throat> well, the important part is to eat whole grains because whole grains offer all the vitamins and minerals that you can get from grains that are important as the, as a round, to round out your nutrients. They also contain carbohydrates. So just eating, like I said, a balanced diet needs carbohydrates. Some people say up to 50% of your calories. So I, I, don't, I don't have a strong opinion on that. The balance between carbohydrate, protein, and fat is very important. So it turns out that what's happened in processed foods is we've made white flour, we've taken the grain away and all the vitamins and all the good things, and almost all processed foods have, are made of carbohydrates that have lost all their nutritional value. So it's very difficult to eat processed food and get nutrients. They just aren't there. Dana, and um, then let's have a bit of a conversation among the boards about, Dick sort of teed it up, but what are the implications and, and what do we want to do with this at this point? Dana. So maybe my comment will lead into that conversation. Yesterday we got to hear from Dr. Thornburg as well, the council, and we saw a 10 minute video, which I think we all felt um, was really powerful. It followed four families with young children and was a documentary of their lives. Um, and I think we had a little discussion about it yesterday. I think what was most striking to us was clearly the poverty that these families were living in um, and clearly the nutrition. It was a lot of what the conversation has been yesterday and today. It showed the pantries and the foods that were being delivered in the shopping habits. But what we didn't actually talk about was the remarkable interactions that you were seeing or between of. the parents and the children in those environments. So a lack of talking to their children, most of the time was spent in front of a TV or with a cell phone, um, possibly signs of depression as a pediatrician. And so I think for me on the Early Learning Council, those interactions are a lot of what drive our work. We're talking about positive quality environments in the earliest years that can help them be successful when they reach education. Um, and I feel very strongly that a lot of what we're doing is going to really have an impact. But I think the research shows that improving those early learning experiences aren't the only things that are going to change the outcome. And so 
the work needs to be much broader than that and has to include our policies that have been spoken about, how we deliver health services, public health, um, housing, our food policies. So I think for me, it's always been such a privilege to be on the Early Learning Council as someone from the health field, but I think this work to me just reinforces, you know, not just educating people, I think DIC is a really important thing about these linkages, but also thinking about when we're talking about education and early learning policy, it's actually touching on health policy and it's touching on poverty policy. So I just, um, you know, I don't want to minimize what we do. I think it's incredibly important, but I, I think this research really strives to show us that we're missing a lot if we don't think about the broader implications of this research. Council and board members, other thoughts about implications and what, if anything, we want to do at this point? Yeah, Chair Henry. I, I very appreciate uh, the comment there and, and maybe full loop and when we talk about some of the full day kindergarten and some of the other things we're, we're thinking about, we'll at least make part of circle. You, you mentioned some of the groundbreaking work that had been done in Scandinavia. You mentioned Finland and I've had a chance to see both Finnish and Swedish early childhood. And um, is there anything that other folks are doing? You mentioned France, I, I think, for a little bit. That other folks are doing policy-wise that, that seems to be helpful in terms of both the educational nature, the health nature, and, and of making that a public message that, that seems to make a difference. What have you seen out there good? <laughs> Well, the, the, there's a book written about the, the revolution of food in France, and it happened in about 1890. And, then, and that's because the French were upset because they were losing wars because their young men were too wimpy. And they thought that better nutrition would help. So what they did was put a policy in that every child should eat the vitamins that come from French soil. So at that time, they were saying everybody should raise their own food and that farmers should be respected and that people should eat whole foods. They didn't know what we know now. They didn't mention epigenetics, but it turns out that they got it right. And French people now are among the healthiest in the world. They have the lowest rates of chronic disease. So I don't see any reason why we can't tell people the truth about how health works. It's a very simple thing and start talking about how our society can change its food culture because we're all concerned about it. If it comes from the ivory tower of the university, it'll go nowhere. It has to become a grassroots movement of people who see that we can do something important. And, and I believe that brainstorming this among ourselves is the way to go. Thank you. Um, Doctor, um, I saw a slide that had Canada and Mexico, and you said that the, the folks that lived there when they came here, they. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Or what was, do you know why? I mean, I, I think I know why, but. Yeah, well. Um, what was going on, I guess, in their countries first? And then, because there's stressors in those countries, there's poverty, there's. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting situation. Uh, there's virtually no heart disease in Mexico. It's very low. It's almost as low as it was in about 1920 in the United States. And their low rates of heart disease uh, come from the fact that even though they eat fats that we would consider unhealthy a lot, for, they nevertheless eat many, many more fruits and vegetables than we do as a whole. Now, of course, there are exceptions to that. But when Mexicans come to the United States, they have no heart disease or diabetes, but their children do. And the third generation children now are starting to get obese and have these at earlier ages. So we're very concerned that the very good tasting, delicious, fast food opportunities in this country make it possible for kids to start on a pathway of eating a poor diet very early in their life. And by the time they're adults, they ha are very vulnerable because of some poverty and issues that you were talking about before. They're a vulnerable population, and as such, they have not experienced the disease that comes from that vulnerability until they've been here on a poor diet. So I'm, I don't want to cut the conversation short, but I'm mindful of time and the fact that we have two really important additional topics on the agenda for today. <coughs> Council members, board members, other thoughts about implications that you want to bring forward into our conversations throughout today and hopefully going forward as well? Well, the, um, the most obvious one in my mind is um, 
<coughs> the education campaign being uh, somehow linked into our uh, ongoing. So what are the implications? The, the world in which we do have um, direct touch. So what would this mean for, one example is all the programs that are funded through the Relief Nursery, there's no hanging fruit. What kind of educational materials should be developed and integrated into Relief Nurseries and Oregon Head Start pre-kindergarten and um, whatever and professional development around it. Anyway, so um, th that, you know, my thought is where, where's our sphere of influence and uh, could we use this information? Maybe, you know, have your help, if at all possible, in developing some accessible materials so that uh, to do professional development for all of these people and, and materials for the parents. If I might add, just on top of that is also preparation of teachers, um, as right. we're going to talk about a little bit. We're right. talking about uh, needing more kindergarten teachers. Um, those teachers all need certification, and part of the certification is what the program uh, right. what's developed in the programs uh, for, for teacher development, both pre-service and as well as in-service. Uh, yes, Jim. So I could ask a question and then come back with yeah. Am I, uh, Kent, Dr. Thornburg. Kent's fine. Um, somewhere in my mind, I recall that half the births in either Oregon or the U.S. are to poor families. Does that sound about right? 44% of births in Oregon are born to WIC mothers. Okay. So let's round it up um, to say half. <laughs> and we have people that are non-low income. But if that's, if that's a measure of the kind of struggle we're having as a surrogate for better data, then I would argue that that piles a lot of weight on the points you already made. Um, <clears throat> and let me say that I think there's an opportunity here. Um, the one thing that I think is different about Oregon in the last four or five years is John Kitzhaber's um, sort of focus on breaking down a bunch of systems and building up different systems. I think that from, from my perspective, having been in my job for 30 years, this is a kind of a time of change which represents opportunity. And I think we need to look at the work we're doing, the last statement Dr. Thornburg made <coughs> is that we could be spinning our wheels um, if no matter what we do. I think we have to figure out how Dick's idea or some other surrogate for that, so, somehow we're going to coordinate this across a bunch of different silos. And I don't think we have an opportunity to do that, <coughs> have ever had an opportunity to do that like we do now. And so I think that Dick's committee, if he's willing to have me hijack it a little bit, um, should be a committee to try and see how we could push this message and coordination down in a bunch of different silos, including the CCOs, including we're going through with the community action programs and, and DHS and housing programs. We're looking at changes right now. There's an opportunity to sort of bring this message in there and get a focus on whatever the result is we need to do. So I would, I would encourage us to support something like that. Great. I'm Kim, Terry, and then we're going to wrap this up and move on to another important topic. And yeah. Thank you for that. I think it was a good segue. Bobby, when you talked about that low-hanging fruit, I think you're right. But I think um, our food program through the Department of Education, our CACFP program, needs some changes as well. <laughs> <laughs> for those of us who participate in the school lunch program, um, I think that's a big <coughs> I think that's that's the big end that's sure. the elephant in our room sure. and so I think you're right there's all this at a local mm -hmm. level we can do but until we as a state can make a decision that the buck stops here with us <laughs> and this is how we're going to move forward with change um, it's not going to happen so I guess I'm going to call out that elephant and say that our food program mm -hmm. isn't helping us any. Okay. I, uh, I'm thinking a little further upstream, and I think about the work that um, we do in our committee with um, the Oregon Health Policy Board, <clears throat> and I think we really need to start talking about does that adolescent well-child visit include reproductive life course planning with those adolescents? Do they start to talk to them about their sexual health, well-being, planning for that future pregnancy? 
Um, and, and as well, with all women of childbearing age, are there um, providers asking them about pregnancy intention? Are they um, working with all women of reproductive age about do they plan to become pregnant? And then um, if, they, if they do, this is what you do. If you don't, this is what contraception means. And if you really don't know or don't care, these are the steps you need to take um, to make sure you're you're having a healthy baby. I don't think those things really happen. I don't think in a, I don't know how long you get allotted for a well child visit, nine minutes or some s ridiculous amount of time. You can't have those sorts of in-depth conversations with, with um, adolescents and families and we need to, we need to bend the curve. It doesn't have to happen by the physician. It can happen, you know, with a health educator or a nurse in the office and that can happen really very well and easily, but we need to build a mechanism so that it, happens and we start to recognize <coughs> that um, reproductive life course planning is something we need to talk about. So I said we'd wrap it up after this. Again, we have some important other topics to get to. Let me suggest, and I can do this for the council, I'm not sure what to do for the board. So uh, for we the- We take suggestions. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna add a suggestion on my little list here then. Um, so council members, uh, my suggestion for us uh, just listening to this, so that we take um, we take at, we take three steps. The first step is later in our agenda as a council, we have our master strategy um, conversation, which is uh, for board members. We we are putting all of our activities into a master strategy. We're provisionally approving it today. Um, we're going to do some more work on it in a retreat in this fall, but that we take the opportunity of this message to see where we can weave it in with activities that are already required of us on our plate for statutory reasons or whatever other reasons they land up in that master strategy. My second suggestion, um, and I would be happy to volunteer for this if Kent is willing to work with me because we live close together at OHSU, um, is to, to explore whether there are opportunities um, to create the kinds of materials that Bobby was talking about that we then can use with our programs um, and in our professional development um, and uh, in our uh, child care licensing uh, and so on. And then the third suggestion is a, a slight variation of Dick's um, which sort of marries the previous two which is that we, we with intention identify opportunities to, to shine a spotlight on this message across the various silos that we touch. So we have an inner, um, we have a, a joint committee with the Health Policy Board that Terry was referencing. Um, it would be an example. Kent has actually presented to that uh, committee, but we, we had a presentation and we didn't pick it up and do anything with it, but that we intentionally identify opportunities to shine a spotlight on this message where we go. Um, and then my, f so council members, I'll stop there. Any objection to those? Lynn. One thing I just might add is that I do think this is kind of the purpose of the architecture of the hubs, which is that they should be in their communi community orchestrating relationships with food banks and food, uh, yeah. <clears throat> churches do food, pa food <coughs> pantries, because your point that if we don't get the nutrition to the brain, <coughs> the educational piece is just pointless. So. I think that is exactly the reason for the hub architecture and should be a easy fix. Agreed, let's call that out when we look at the master strategy and when we can plug that in. And, I, and Megan is here and I know we are uh, beginning the habit of getting the <coughs> together regularly. Um, so I, I heard no objection from council. I saw a thumbs up. So we're gonna proceed council on those three points. Uh, my request or suggestion of the board is that you likewise look for those opportunities. We've had one the specific opportunity was suggested around the department's food program. Um, and there may be others as well. And I, I think Rob looks like he's about to say something. But, um, <laughs> but I think we can uh, have some more conversation about this. Uh, we just went through a whole uh, piece with the uh, uh, Next Generation Science Standards, which it seems to me there are ample uh, places to, to dig into this. And um, uh, one of Rob's specialists, uh, Karen, has on, on, been listening to us on the on the phone and maybe we can get back to this in terms of an, uh, an agenda item where we do some more specifics in, in terms of plugging things in. Uh, I didn't mean to speak for you, Rob, but sure I was no, just no. talking about the board's piece there. Right, and I think that would be you know great around the, the education piece of it. Also, 
Um, the school nutrition <coughs> program also lives at the Department of Education. It's a it's part of our department, and um, it is highly regulated by the federal government. Mm -hmm. Probably about as regulated as it's more regulated than special ed. So in the yeah. education world, wow. that's a pretty remarkable comment. Um, but it is incredibly regulated. Uh, um, it would be I think it'd be great to bring to the state board some presentation about um, what the requirements are, what drives mm -hmm. those requirements, um, and what kinds of delivery mechanisms we have and how those balance up with some of these recommendations would be really um, interesting. And then we might be able to create some um, policy or at least some expectations about how Oregon wants to react to that. So perhaps we have a quest, request of Dr. Thornbrook, which is as you have this NIH meeting all week next week in Washington, this notion of the federal policies and regulations that prevent us in some ways, at least school food program being a great example of that, yeah. there are probably others. The limitations of the WIC program are enormous. Yes, that's yeah. right. WIC would be another. Yeah. In child care. Oh, that's right. And we also, <coughs> so they're, uh, in the early learning division is the child care licensing, and there are um, regulations there that huh. offer as well. Yeah, I didn't so know So those about three that. are being. Mm. All right. Uh, thank you so much for being. Thank with you. Us I today. just want you all to know I'm one of your fans. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to turn this. Yeah. So, with apologies for running a bit late, we will catch up, um, and I'm going to turn this over to Samuel for our next very important topic. Okay. Full day kindergarten. We're going to start out with a report <laughs> and uh, and also have both board and council discussion. And while they're coming up, just to remind you, we're going to have uh, uh, public comment uh, in a little bit. And um, Emily, is there a list, or do we have a list somewhere for you? Have okay, wonderful. So if you are planning public comment, please sign up. Thank you, Craig and John. It's all yours. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Craig Hawkins from COSA with John Peterson, superintendent here in Pendleton, and appreciate the opportunity to talk with you about the very important topic of full-day kindergarten. Before I go there, I wanted to share a couple of things. Uh, the teacher I thought of, Sam, when you, when you um, uh, did the activity this morning, I had a teacher named Mr. Crow. He was my fourth grade teacher, and he, you know, maybe, maybe we all have this person in our lives. He was the, the person that helped me understand that, you know, I could do better than kind of muddle along that, that uh, there was more potential there and, and uh, really inspired me a lot. And so I appreciate that activity. It, it, it's always nice to remember folks that have made a real impact in our life. The second thing is I'd, I'd like to say is how much I appreciated the previous presentation. We've been having a lot of conversation in our organization and specifically with superintendents about the really important intersection and possibilities that exist when we're talking about early learning, health and k-12 and I'm really encouraged to hear that the, the committee work that you're thinking about doing I can tell you that it's going to be a focus of our organization those three pieces um, over the next couple of years it's begun already to be that um, there's no question that those three have to go together if we're going to be successful in, in achieving not only the target we've set for third grade literacy but ultimately graduation, success in college and career, and of course in you know, achieving our 40-40-20 goal. We have to work together, and, and the, the, the partnership between early learning, our communities of health, and, uh, and K-12 is, is absolutely essential. So I guess as, as, I, as, as we had the opportunity to come here today, that I was really going to talk about how cool it is to see the State Board and the Early Learning Council together because of the, the need for that partnership. And it's the kind of work that, that I know that we hope to do, um, not only at our organization, but superintendents and school districts with early learning providers going forward, with early learning agencies, et cetera. And, and so, as you know, we've got a, a report with some recommendations that I think you've all seen, right? You've got it. That, that um, report was developed beginning late last summer uh, through this spring um, in a work group that consisted 
primarily of superintendents, but also others as part of the conversation. Um, it, um, it, it was processed pretty deliberately. Several meetings, uh, several interactions with statewide, <coughs> at statewide meetings of superintendents where they discussed, reacted, uh, uh, proposed changes. And the report you see is actually, I think the front of it's dated January, but it really wasn't finished until early April. Or early April. So, so, you know, it's been through a few iterations. The very first full report was in January. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what's in the report. Not, not a lot because you've got it. You have the opportunity to read it. But, uh, I think the, the first and most important thing, and, and really is for, for the work group, I think John would, would agree with me, there were really two key findings that, that came out of that work. The first is a real commitment to full day kindergarten for every student in Oregon. I mean, superintendents believe it, it's not only an equity issue, but obviously it's a key education issue. And, and the rationale for for full day kindergarten and the investment in full day kindergarten and early learning is included in the report. The, the, the one, of, one of the things the report may feel like, especially up front, is a little heavy on an emphasis on the funding needed. Well, obviously we need funding. Got, got to have the funding to do the full day kindergarten program, but, but it's, it's, that, that funding is, is really, um, uh, in our minds, it was implicit, implicit in the original legislation in the first place. We wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have come up with a plan to implement full day kindergarten in the state without thinking that we needed to provide funding for it. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the funding. We know, we know it's there. We know what's needed. We know that we're, we're going to, need, for example, hire 800 to 1,000 new kindergarten teachers to implement the program. There are lots of costs with um, sub, uh, educational assistance and other support pieces that go along with that. Um, uh, but, but what I'd really like to focus on is what the second real learning or finding from the group was. And it's really about the partnerships. And we recognize that we can't achieve the goal, the goal of, of third grade literacy and, <coughs> and the goals beyond that without the partnerships that, that I talked about in the beginning. And so, so we look forward to doing those pieces together. The, the one example of the kinds of opportunities we have for partnership is around professional development. There's no reason that professional development, especially in the early learning through K3 realm, needs to be siloed. In fact, you know, we would contend that it needs to be a cross level and it needs to feel like a true collaboration and partnership in terms of, you know, that we could develop curriculum and align it together. Why, aren't, why not? We should be working on that. We should be training on, on <coughs> effective instructional practices and strategies together. And, and um, we would, we would uh, offer um, our partnership in doing that. Many of you know that we um, had a full day kindergarten summit in partnership with the department and others uh, earlier this month. Incredibly well attended, clearly a big need for additional training and supports over the next, especially over the next year and a half or so. And uh, we look forward to doing that. Um, that's that's a kind of a state level piece. <coughs> The, the, the collaboration that we had there around the summit is kind of a state level piece, but there's collaboration and conversation going in every community in Oregon right now between early learning, K-12, how are we gonna work together? And, and one of the really cool things about being in Pendleton is we have a tremendous example of that kind of partnership right here. And, and uh, well, John was one of the co-chairs of the work group. He's really, I know, excited to share with you what's going on in Pendleton in this arena. So, John. Great. Uh, thanks to the, the board uh, and the Early Learning Council for making the trek to Eastern Oregon. It's not all that common that we have uh, this kind of a meeting in, in Pendleton, but you're, you're, uh, we certainly appreciate you being here today. Uh, I remember my, uh, my first memory of uh, early teacher uh, was at Glencoe Elementary School by Mount Tabor. <laughs> and uh, here's what I remember. Uh, her name was Mrs. Haverkamp, and that's about it. <laughs> I, 
I, I, was, I, was, fear, I was fearful of, of her. Uh, I, I remember that part too. Um, but I did have a fantastic fifth grade teacher once our family moved here to Pendleton. Her name is uh, Ms. Danforth, Muriel Danforth. She's still a member of our community and, uh, and I have many great memories of my time in Ms. Danforth's classroom. Um, Craig and I are here to talk with you about full day kindergarten and as Craig indicated I don't think there's much uh, need for us to talk about the report you have the report and uh, we don't want to dwell on the funding piece at all uh, but I can tell you as the co-chair of uh, that committee um, and the many conversations we had around the state with other uh, superintendents with teachers uh, with principals with uh, uh, our, our partners uh, everyone uh, is excited about the possibility of, of having a full day kindergarten program and and in Pendleton I think that's especially true um, we've been looking forward to the opportunity to have full day kindergarten in Pendleton for quite some time and it, it's going to be a reality for us in the fall of 2015 um, we were fortunate last November that we were able to pass a bond uh, for uh, it turned out to be about 57 million dollars which is fairly significant here in Pendleton with the money from that bond we will be uh, replacing two of our old elementary buildings um, and building brand new schools but the the real centerpiece of our bond and uh, the real focus for our conversation with our community was around an old building that's down in the middle of town called Hawthorne. Uh, Hawthorne is in a, uh, it used to be an elementary building here in Pendleton. It has, uh, we vacated that building because of declining enrollment and, and uh, budget problems about 10 years ago. And we've rented out rooms to the Intermountain ESD. We've used it for our alternative education program. We've rented out rooms to Head Start and we haven't maintained the building. Uh, but the centerpiece of this bond project is to go into that building and create what we will be calling the Pendleton Early Learning Center. And that building will house all of our kindergarten programs. Uh, in Pendleton, we typically have about 250 kids per grade level. So the way the, uh, the lay of the land right now, that means we'll have about 10 kindergarten classrooms with 25 kids there. Um, we will also have many partners in that facility, um, including the Intermountain ESD. Uh, they con we contract with the Intermountain ESD to run our early childhood special education <coughs> early intervention programs. Uh, we will be a partner with Umatilla Moro Head Start, um, and we already are. Obviously, they're in, they're in the building now, but they're going to have to move out for a year while we remodel and repurpose the building. Uh, we will have a partnership and, and currently do uh, with the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, uh, the tribal education program. Um, we look forward to uh, further developing that and moving into the early learning uh, area with them. Uh, WIC will be in, in our facility. Uh, Umatilla County Health Department, we are uh, going to have a health clinic in this facility. Uh, Department of Human Services will be there. The Pioneer Relief nurse, Nursery will have uh, an office there and um, possibly more than that as time goes by. But right now, uh, they have a pretty sweet deal in Pendleton where they basically have a rent-free facility. Um, and, and they're not going to leave that uh, when we open, but they are going to have an office in, in our facility. Uh, we look forward to a partnership with BMCC uh, in their early uh, uh, childhood program. Um, Lifeways Mental Health will have a presence in our facility. Um, we will have a private daycare provider um, that will be there. And um, the building will also serve as our Ready for Kindergarten headquarters. We have a Ready for Kindergarten program in this region. It's been uh, focused in Pendleton 
and it, it's been amazing to watch how that program has grown in the last couple of years. We've gone from having uh, five or six parents show up to those meetings uh, to now having 40 or so that are, that are, that are coming. And we know that's going to continue, continue to grow. Um, but we are uh, modeling our program really after the Gladstone Center for Children and Families, uh, except ours will be a larger facility and there'll be more kids in the building. Uh, and we anticipate uh, future partnerships uh, as we move forward. The design of the building is allowing us for um, future growth. Uh, we're basically building it uh, into, in a U shape and, and we look forward for our next step uh, to close off the U and, and have, have it completely um, uh, uh, around a courtyard kind of a playground area. Um, the thing that I think is most exciting to me about this endeavor is uh, <coughs> this was my first opportunity I guess you want to call it an opportunity uh, <laughs> to pass a bond. <laughs> um, and um, I was, I'll be quite honest, I was shocked in, in and around our community when I started talking with people about this early childhood partnership concept. Um, it, it didn't start out being something that we thought we could sell as being the centerpiece of our bond but we quickly realized that was it. That was what, was, what resonated with folks in, in Pendleton. They bought into it for uh, obvious reasons, and, um, and I couldn't be more thrilled. We passed our bond with a 65% approval um, rate, which is, um, which is pretty yeah. <laughs> remarkable, uh, and we're proud of that. And we also, as part of this, are um, closing the doors in a couple of uh, older elementary buildings that are on our more affluent <coughs> north side of town. Um, and we had some resistance to that idea, but the more we talked and the more people listened, the more they were, were supportive of, of the idea. And I think that just shows a lot about this whole idea that we can be partners between K-12 and early learning. Um, and and I, I have people coming out of the woodwork on a daily basis that are, that are coming to me saying, we want in, somehow we want in. Um, and we have a lot of work to do over the next year while we're under construction and, and we're starting to develop our program. But we couldn't be more thrilled with where we are and what we're, we're headed toward. I'd also like to take an opportunity to just She'll hate me for this, but uh, Lori Hale is, uh, is going to be our principal at uh, the Pendleton Early Learning Center. Lori was a very, very successful kindergarten teacher for years in our district, and she has been the principal most recently at Lincoln Primary School. And we're thrilled to have uh, Lori move into that position, not only because she's an excellent administrator, but because she has a real a genuine interest and passion for kindergarten. Uh, and, and she was a fantastic teacher in, in, uh, in our district for many years there. But um, we thought it'd be helpful for you to kind of have a snapshot of what it looks like locally here and how exciting it is for us. We are having conversations now that we never thought of having um, five years ago. and and and. I sit down next to Kathy Wamsley from Umatilla Morrow Head Start, and we know one another. We're actually friends. <laughs> Five years ago, she didn't know me, and I didn't know her. I hope so. Uh, She's right. And I can give you several other examples of those kinds of things that are happening because of the work that <coughs> we're doing. It is such an exciting time here in Pendleton, and I believe across the state of Oregon. And uh, it's so logical for us to take the next step in K-12 to go to a full day kindergarten program. And I'm passionate about that being, uh, that being one piece of this puzzle. The other piece is the connection with early childhood and the partnerships that we can form. Thank you. Rob? Uh, yeah, just first of all, I just want to say thank you for being here. And uh, always a great welcome that it seems like everybody gets Hello? when they come out to Eastern Oregon. 
Um, and I, I want to I wanna just talk for a second about like the unbelievable importance of leadership in this work. And, and really and truly, I want to give credit where credit's due, because I started thinking about, well, where's the leadership in this? And honest to goodness, the leadership that our governor has shown um, in this effort about trying to think about a system and how we bring parts together and allow things like the Early Learning Council and the State Board and the Higher Education Coordinating Commission and many others to say, let's set policy that makes it easy for great leaders in the state to step into this void that's been created in, 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 a, in, in not having a system. And then you look at people like John here who really now for the first time, um, always a great leader, always working hard within his system here in Pendleton around K-12. And now the things that I see that are taking place in Pendleton are just exciting beyond belief. And I, I credit Mark Mulvihill with a big piece of this as well. Just these two leaders out here, and there are others, who can look at what's possible that's been created by this system that's been laid out by you know, all of our leader and start to step into this void that's been there around how do we do this around early childhood and really connect all parts of the community. And it's impressive that this part of Oregon, which is maybe kind of the right size to be an early incubator, where you know everybody knows one another and can begin to um, generate some examples for the rest of us. And so uh, what's happening here in early learning is really impressive. I think about you know Bob Stewart and Don Grotting, a couple other great leaders in the state in the K-12 system who are kind of stepping into uh, this possibility and being other examples. And I hear a little bit about Gladstone being replicated. And, you know, what a great example. And then, <coughs> but it isn't just that, right? It is then, what, so what's happening in early learning? How's that been tied together? Um, how's the community come together to create this great opportunity? But then what happens in the K-12 system? And then the other uh, unbelievable example that we have out in this region uh, is in the college going. And you know, we're going to see some of that this afternoon. And so it is, it is a beginnings of, or a really great example of the system that it is that we're kind of dreaming about creating on a statewide basis. And the leadership that um, these people have taken out in this region to cause this to happen, and the knowledge about how to bring great people into the mix. Um, I'm just really excited to see what's happening here. But I, I, I really wanted to just thank you know, uh, John and Mark for their incredible leadership in this region. Um, and and uh, congratulate them for the way that they're bringing their community together and how they're taking this opportunity that's been created in the <coughs> new system and the policies that you all set uh, to take advantage of it for their community and for the kids that they serve. So just want, thank you very much for your great leadership. Thank you. <coughs> Comments? Oh. Yes, please. You can go first. Great, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I'm curious to know, have you met any child care providers yet? We, we have child uh, care providers knocking on our door. Good. Uh, we, we currently um, you, lease some of our property to uh, a couple of local child care providers. <coughs> and so for us, we're kind of looking at it more as if we have to make a tough decision probably. Yeah. On, on, on who's going to occupy that space. Right. And, then, and do you know about how many licensed, in, like, licensed in-home providers you have in the area that would feed into? The... I, I'm not really sure on right. that. Yeah. I, I work with licensed or represent them, so the licensed in-home child care providers, so that's why I asked. Well, um, we, we, did, uh, we did receive a small grant from the Oregon Community Foundation, the P3 alignment grant, last year. To, to start with some of this work and uh, our folks that have been on the ground in, in that program have actually been out and tried to make connections with the child care providers. I haven't been directly involved in that work. Mm -hmm. We've had a principal here at Sherwood Elementary School who's done a lot of that. We received another grant to take that work a little bit further, but certainly the connection with uh, child care providers is going to be a key piece of that. I'm happy to help. May I ask another? Oh. Uh, <laughs> Keep going. Oh, okay. Um, uh, this is about. Uh, I, I'm fascinated about that. Your early learning center is one place, and all the kindergarten would be there. I'm curious about uh, access for families that might ha not have, you know, the best transportation options, and ha you know what. Uh, what's what's that going to look like? You know, are you going to have a robust busing program? And uh, we we have current current. Currently in Pendleton, uh, about 
two thirds of our kids are bused in the elementary level, mm -hmm. and uh, our bus company says this will be a better system for them, bringing all of our kinders right in the middle of town instead of to the to the four or five other elementary schools that are that are located throughout Pendleton. We don't see the transportation piece being a problem at all. In fact, we think it's going to help um, help our uh, our folks uh, transport kids t in a more timely fashion. Great. Yeah, I was just curious. I, I just walked from the hotel, so I was like, wow, oh, this is yeah. pretty spread out. And I was yeah. just curious about transportation options in <laughs> Pendleton. <laughs> Made me think about it. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. No, and there's a piece in the report about some of the transportation resources. I right. must have not read that part. Sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> I just wanted to add, Rob actually took many of the same comments, which is actually nice that we're all thinking the same way. And some of the future learning that we're having is that um, what Pendleton has done, what Gladstone has done, is what David Douglas has done, is they just didn't start their own preschools in their program. And this is part of the governor's vision, is that we don't want schools just to start preschools in schools and put their community providers out of business because we want to make sure that parents have many, many options. So if those are home care, those are a number of things. And this is the future learning, I believe, that we can do together because Head Start is an easy partner because there are many times in your schools are right there to do. The next part is going to be a little harder as you look at reaching out in the communities. And I am so confident that here um, in the conversations with John and Mark and Kathy is that we will reach out to those providers not only to share those experiences but to help support them in their businesses that they have and in coming into school. And in the later report in our hubs, which I know the council will be very <coughs> excited about that, is you'll get to hear a little example in one of our early learning hubs, Frontier, what they've done to bring their child care providers and their kindergartens together. So um, we will continue to work on those partnerships to be strong. And thank you. Um, I want to thank you. And I want to thank you for thinking outside the box. And by box, I mean portable classroom. Um, I, I'm really concerned when I read the report that it's mentioned about the ability of districts to buy portables. Um, there was just a report that came out about how they are not a good learning environment, um, not only because of the toxins that get released out of the building, but the way they're set up are not good learning environments for kids. And so I have real concern that we're going to see a bunch of kinders or other kids pushed into those because we're not supporting the infrastructure that needs to happen to really build a good learning environment. And I know that all the kinders aren't going to go into those, but somebody's somebody's going, whether it's the third graders go into the portables. But, and that seems to be the, um, the knee jerk. And, and I understand the funding issues and all that. But it's just really quite concerning to me that um, that is the reflexive action. And I'm really um, grateful to you to look in, in a different direction. We, we were fortunate in Pendleton we had a 20-year <coughs> bond that was expiring, so uh, the timing was right for us. And we did not have a plan B. We went into November 5th, 2013, praying that we were going to pass the bond so that we could accommodate our full-day kindergarten needs. Had, had the <coughs> bond failed, I, I'm pretty sure I'd be right in line with other superintendents that would have orders placed right now for modular classrooms that would house probably our fifth grade kids in some buildings so we could move our uh, kindergartners into the regular building. But you're absolutely right. And, and I think superintendents around the state feel the same way. But it is kind of where they are and what they have to do. So a couple of comments I had. So one of these I say everywhere I go. So if I were queen for day, and we <laughs> talked about, I'm, I'm zeroing in on the professional development recommendations here. and so. Uh, Ditto to all the things that has been, and the and the praise and accolades to the Pendleton School District for all the work. We got a little peek at some of that yesterday, and it was very exciting. So I want to f zero in on the professional development pieces in here. So again, if I were queen for a day, professional development for all of our teachers, and I mean our our early learning teachers as well, would be from age three to grade three, because that's the de that developmental period has a lot in common. 
zero to three has a different set of developmental tasks, but I would have us working together for a seamless continuum age three to grade three. So I just, I say that everywhere I go, and I, I just want to say that here that while, while we have your recommendations <coughs> before us. I also want to make a couple of comments about um, how difficult that is culturally for us and how we have some work cut out for us. And I want to illustrate that with two, by two, by two illustrations. The first is that um, we have, the council has um, some opportunity to let out some professional development funds coming up. And uh, as we get applications, from, I, I want to suggest that that may be an opportunity to further some of what you want to do here. But we've already received applications for that and I want to suggest that early learning uh, professional development doesn't often think of reaching up, if you will, into K-3. And then I also want to illustrate that we, later today, the council will award our first round of kin kindergarten partnership innovation grants. And a number of those grant applications, I was able to read them all, a number of those grant applications were focused on professional development. And when they came from a school district, they included um, uh, stipends for teachers who would miss their school day to go do professional <coughs> development. But they, if they included early learning teachers, which they didn't always do, they did not include a stipend for early learning teachers. So we aren't thinking from a K-12 perspective about how we reach down into that age three up. And from an age three perspective, we aren't thinking about, or down, and we, we aren't thinking about how we reach up. So I just want to illustrate that we have a lot of it's not bad, no malintention on anybody's part, but we just even aren't thinking about it yet. So I want to use your report as an opportunity to say we have to start thinking about that. You know, uh, you know, I think the good news, though, is we are thinking about high quality programs. It's just that we don't necessarily know how to get there. Yeah. No, that's right. That's our job. And, and that's, we, that's the, uh, we see that in Pendleton as being kind of the next step. And I think we can help you. I think there are many partners. Yes, that's right. Including some of Rob's folks, uh, kindergarten teachers, and Rob. So <clears throat> I have a tendency to oversimplify things sometimes. So I'll try to keep Bye. it, and then other times not at all. So I'll try to keep it in the ahead, keep it, it keep it between the <laughs> keep it between the lines here just a little bit. But when I when I look at this and think about the effort, and and you know we have this 40, 40, 20. Um, intended outcome. <coughs> and when I think about 40, 40, 20 and the idea that what, what we need to do is make some investments along the continuum that are really good and smart investments that will lead us to 40, 40, 20 and sort of what's the best return on investment within that continuum. Um, I think we all understand that one of the really key parts of this is can students read at the end of third grade? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it isn't the only thing. But it is um, amongst the pathway or along the pathway incredibly important. And the truth is, if you can't read by the end of third grade, you're in really, really dire trouble um, to have any opportunity for a successful future. And it's not that it can't be done. It just is that it's rare. And when it comes to return on investment, <coughs> it's incredibly intensive. And so uh, when I look at all this and I try to think about what we're doing, um, this idea of third grade literacy really looms in my thinking about all this. And when I think about why are we talking about full day kindergarten? I honestly believe that the, re the reason and the only reason to talk about full day kindergarten, again, this is my oversimplification, is to ensure that kids are readers by the end of third grade. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at the report, um, I, I love the fact that, you know, on this page where it says comparison of full day versus half day, there's a thing that says 90 minute literacy block. And I do think that that's really important, but it gets at what I want to what I want to make a few comments about, and that is that within this and within the report, and as we begin to talk about this into the future, I would make a recommendation that we have to talk about really high quality literacy programs, yes. and we know what really high quality literacy programs look like and what components they hold. We have to start when we start talking about this, the literacy piece, and even what it is that we're going to do in early childhood and then the transition from early childhood to kindergarten, we have to start with the idea of equity in mind. It cannot be an add-on. It cannot be something that we begin to think about later. But we have to start and say, how do we design? This is new. This is a new opportunity. How do we design this new opportunity in our thinking so that equity is the foundation of the work? How do we engage the community so that equity is the foundation of the work? How do we use the kindergarten assessment 
to ensure that we think about how we resource in a way that has equity be the foundation of the work because if we don't close the achievement gap by the time we get to the end of third grade reading, that achievement gap cannot be closed. And so whatever we do within these programs, we have to make sure that we have a learning trajectory that closes the achievement gap by the end of third grade. And that achievement gap can be closed significantly if all students are able to read on grade level by the end of third grade. And so how we engage, how we resource, how we design all has to be about um, equity, which means that the community involvement, the, the um, training that's done, the attention to detail around culturally relevant teaching practices and the engagement to the family and the engagement of the community and those community providers who can deliver um, these programs in, it, with, uh, in an equitable, equitably effective way so that we do have cultural relevance within all that we do is incredibly important. And then lastly, just around the literacy component of this, again, we know what really effective literacy programs look like. We have a problem, uh, just to be really frank, that people don't always enjoy as much um, teaching in really highly effective literacy programs. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really, and I don't, you know, I don't understand that specifically, but I just know it to be true. People like to be individual practitioners, and we cannot afford that. It is a huge error on our part. We need to identify this is a highly effective literacy program, and we know from research and evidence base where it's actually been applied what that looks like. We need to ensure that anyone who is implementing a literacy program understands what that looks like and must meet the requirements of evidence-based. And then we need to know what components exist within an evidence-based literacy program and demand that they're implemented any place someone's going to re receive resource around a literacy program. And then uh, we need to make sure that we monitor uh, both how, how implementation is done for a high level of fidelity and we need to monitor outcomes. And that really is from um, pre-kinder all the way to the end of third grade, perhaps beyond. But we can absolutely change our trajectory of learners in the state if we can put those things in place, demand that they happen, and ensure that they do. I really believe that we can get 95% of our third graders to read at grade level, if not beyond in the state of Oregon. But it is going to take a level of determination, expertise, and demand that we've not experienced. And so I just want to, I want to lay that out for people. Um, I, I know that there are lots of folks who worry about seeing this thing that says 90 minute literacy block. And I want to emphasize that learning in kindergarten um, also needs to involve a great deal of play, but that those two things are not mutually exclusive. And within these programs, the way that we think about, you know, how do you get over to the number corner and sit on your on your uh, carpet for the day can involve all kinds of learning around early numeracy and early literacy. And that entire event can be joyful and fun and it can be culturally relevant and we can build scaffolding um, between knowledge base and knowledge need. Within that, we just have to be incredibly skillful. And so all those components need to be thought about and we need to think about those as we set policy and think about how we're going to resource this um, activity and we've got to be very very intentional about how we do this if we're going to realize all that we're capable of realizing in this effort full day K is the first time that we've added an instructional minute in the state of Oregon <coughs> since half day kindergarten was added back in the 80s it's been a really long time 20 I think it's 26 <coughs> years since we've added a minute of instructional time in the state of Oregon this is our opportunity and the combination of these two things as we move through is more powerful than the singular event of full day K. And if we can do these three things right, um, tie together really highly effective early learning programs with kindergarten <coughs> and a full day and then an unbelievable literacy initiative um, until third grade, we will see uh, a synergistic effect that we don't expect. And that's the only way we're going to get to where we need to go. And it's the only opportunity to get to 40, 40, 20. Amen. Okay, I'm off my, <laughs> off my rails. <laughs> well, I always defer to her. It, it, it is that it's really complex, but it's not, you know, I mean, honestly, the components of it, we know what they are. 
The question is, do we have the toughness, the sort of steely-eyed determination to cause it to happen? Yep. This is our opportunity. We have to get it right. And we have to be steely-eyed about how we do that. No doubt about Rob being steely-eyed. <laughs> so, and I don't know that the broader audience here knows that Rob and I are not married or sister and brother, but we are, we think, sixth cousins. So there is kind of, there's the Saxton kind of thing. There's the but, steely eyed Saxton. Uh, yeah, it, we, we do think it's part of the, well, maybe not genes, but so two things, and I, I just amen to that because we can't do a hundred things. We gotta do two or three things really well and with steely-eyed discipline. And I think it's, it's not just that, no, we're not interested in everyone inventing their own literacy program. Um, you can do that after we've got our literacy rate to where it should be, you know, and when there's lots of money and when, and when the unemployment rate is lower than it is and when blah, blah, blah. So we do have to be steely-eyed. We do have to be disciplined and we have to be focused. This isn't something nice we want to get done in the next 30 years. It's, it's urgent that we get it done now. The piece I want to add to that steely-eyed piece, which, which my time in Pendleton, I talked to Mark about this a little bit this morning, is I think you have a unique and special opportunity here because of the progress you've made and because of the critical mass you have in your community as evidenced by what we've seen in the last few days. And that's to two pieces. Number one, we're seeing very little financial innovation in the early learning sector for, us, for an initiative that's been underway for four years. And, and money matters. Um, how it's spent, how it's attained, how it's invested. So you guys have an opportunity here to be looking at how all these programs and pieces come together and where is the opportunity for taking the existing money you have and leveraging it to serve a greater population that's the challenge mark identified yesterday we're not meeting all the need we're not coming close so one of the key metrics we have to keep a steely eye on is are you expanding the number of children served? Not only are you getting the results, but you have to, we all in Oregon, the governor said this in 2010, we have to serve more kids with the same amount of money. The only way to do that is to look intentionally and on a regular basis at your financial metrics. When you put all those entities in, an, in a setting, that's great. The second step and the next level of innovation and sophistication is what are we doing here that's costing us too much money and if we lowered the cost we can get more kids served and and i will guarantee you that whenever you start that kind of effort of consolidating resources there are economies of scale to be attained they have to be attained across organizations that requires every organization to think about their business model differently very doable you've got the perfect kind of testing zone here in pendleton to make that happen. And no one will do it willingly. I'll just tell you right now, not one person will say, yeah, I can change my business model. It takes relentless leadership and steely-eyed discipline, and it's critical that you do it or we can't achieve our goal. Second piece is the IT piece. We think that there's an opportunity in Pendleton to look at your data systems because of the system integration you already have and to create a, a not you know, not fancy, snazzy, complex data system that captures outcomes, but a more simple um, tool that can be used to tell you what you need to know about this integration. So, so I, we are happy to help you do that. We're happy to garner resources. There's all kind of computer wonks in this state. It's not as hard as we've made it out to be. You've got the perfect kind of petri dish for for testing out an IT or management information system that drives to outcomes, and, and we'd love to help you do it. And thank you, and we know how important that will be for us, too. We want to thank you very, oh, it was, <coughs> you had a comment. Uh, it, it's really a, a request, I think. Um, I understand implicitly everything that Rob just said to us, and then it dawns on me, even as a smart reader since the beginning of the program and deeply involved in that, I don't know what the perfect uh, program is that you keep referring to that we we know all that and I've been around the chalkboard project and everything else and I don't think anybody's ever put a slide up that says here here's the recipe if we do this I just like to be on board not just at the rhetoric level but I'd like to know what it is I'm spouting you need about three hours with some of Rob's folks 
Uh, Actually, we have a fairly short presentation at some point in time if people would like to. I, okay, so we'll let's put that on. Okay. Let's, we'll let's that. put that on. Great. Thank you. And again, not to cut anyone off and to thank our, our guests here for A, the hard work that went into making the report and then a little sweat and tears got them before us. Um, but this is a conversation to be continued uh, on, on several different levels. Thank you again. And we're going to ask our next, well, she's going to ask because that's her. <laughs> All right. Very quickly then. Um, we just a, to a process check uh, for everyone and for the next topic. So we have a really important topic next. We only have 10 minutes left and 10 minutes because the state board apparently is on a very tight time frame. So uh, here's our plan. Um, the topic that is next in our agenda is uh, kindergarten and early learning suspensions. This is a critical <coughs> issue. It's also a critical issue of connection between the council and the state board. So my suggestion is we tee this up. We have a couple of pieces of information. I'm going to ask um, Krista and Michael, who are, Mike, Krista's here, Michael's on the phone, to try to be as concise as possible in presenting the information. We're going to try to do a rapid information download in about five minutes. You have material, uh, board members, council members, in your, in your uh, packets. Uh, and then I'm going to suggest that we spend five minutes saying how we want to connect with each other on this issue. This is a uh, really important issue. It's particularly, if you look at the data, it's particularly an important issue related to um, equity and kids of color. And so it's, uh, it deserves more time than we have left, but we wanted to at least spend a couple minutes. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, Krista Rood from the Early Learning Division. And then I think on the phone, let me just, while she's teed up here, uh, Michael Mahoney from ODE, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? We, I think we can hear you just fine. So Chris is going to get us started. We'll ask you to round it off. Um, and she's got your information on PowerPoint slides, which we will project here in the room. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair Curtis, members of the council. I will be brief in my uh, comments. Uh, in March, uh, there was a report released from the U.S. Department of Education Office for Civil Rights that brought to our attention um, disproportionality in suspensions and expulsions and discipline practices practices across the United States. That, atten that attention caused us to look closely at what was happening in Oregon. And the memo that you'll find in your packet provides an overview about early learning. Um, a couple of few high points that I just want to touch on. The first is that the data that was represented in the U.S. Department of Education's report represented 34 preschools that are connected to elementary schools here in Oregon. And it also represents about 3,400 children. When we looked at that data, we noted that there were no expulsions or suspensions um, related to that data in that report. However, we did want to take a closer look at our early learning programs and also kindergarten data to figure out um, what really was the case here in Oregon. And so as you'll note in the report, um, there's a list of the programs that are funded through the state in early learning. And what we found out is that there's not a lot of reporting data that helps us know what actually is happening in practice. We were able to provide um, information about populations who are being served. However, it was difficult to get into real specifics about practice. There were several policies noted. Um, specifically, some programs do not, uh, by policy, are not allowed to do any kind of expulsion or suspension. Um, but we still noted that there, um, there were potentially that there could be anecdotally situations that um, need to be paid attention to. And so um, this information was brought to the council, uh, the Early Learning Council last month, um, and it has then moved to the Early Learning Council subcommittee, and we're bringing it to your attention today. I want to recognize Michael Mahoney, who is on the line with us, and the support um, that we receive from our colleagues um, in the K-12 system in helping us pro understand information from K-12 who have real specific data and at this time I'd like to ask Michael if he'll help us walk through that information. Michael can you hear us you're on. Do I need to? Uh, Michael? It's Pam. Um, I think we are ready for you to present your information. Krista just gave us a very quick walkthrough of the 
of the report, which I know you've seen, and so I know you have some data, which we've teed up on PowerPoint slides. Great. I'll try to act as the kind of the translator bridge. So go ahead. Uh, we're teeing up your first slide. Okay. What are you doing now? I'm Michael Mahoney. I'm the Safe Schools Coordinator at the Oregon Department of Education. And I, I also um, manage the uh, discipline database for the state. So the slide in front of us now, Michael, is the three-year totals, the K-3 three-year total slide. Okay, okay, and what we're looking at there, we're looking at raw numbers. That's the actual number of students that have been excluded, either suspension by suspension or expulsion, uh, split up by the grades K through one, two, and three. As you can see, and there's uh, the three, the totals for the past three years. Now we've got the total population slide. Okay, yeah, and this slide refers to the, um, the, uh, number of kids in each race group that were suspended or expelled uh, in year <coughs> K through three in 2012-13. So what you see at the top of those bars are the percentages of, of children in those racial categories that were excluded. So you see how that illustrates the disproportionality um, primarily uh, with uh, African American or black students. But there's other areas too that are disproportionate if you view them in terms of uh, the percentage of white students or the total. So it's Pam, I just wanna make a note, council members know this because they received the, uh, the US Department of Education report, civil rights report last month. But for board members, if you don't know this, this fairly, fairly closely mirrors um, the US total report and just for clarification uh, Indian and I would add that um, you know that these, this disproportionate uh, rates they continue they really spike in middle school and then they wane down a little through high school but the disproportionality rates have stayed pretty static uh, since we've been looking at this the past five years and Michael there was a question about the uh, Indian uh, race that's listed on the total population <coughs> slide um, yeah. what was the question oh I just I was looking on uh, on page um, three of five of the handout up above it has Indian and then down below it has Native American so who are we representing on this slide so a definition of Indian on this slide is it Native American or East Indian or what's the definition the definition, according to the federal guidelines, it's uh, Native American and Alaskan Indian. Okay, thank you. Okay. So the slide we have now is the uh, third uh, kindergarten through third grade by gender. Yes, yes, and this is um, something we can take a look at. You see, I think it's important uh, that we look at things by gender. The research shows that uh, gender and race are, are two of the key categories when we're looking at this proportionality. Um, and you can see the taller line refers to males. You have it in color, I don't. So you can see the breakdown, male, females, uh, between uh, kindergarten and third grade, 2012-13, and the percentage of those kids of males and percentage of females in each racial category that were excluded from school. And in general, we have disproportionality between males and females, but you can see we also have it amongst the races as well. And so now we have the special education slide, Michael. Okay. This is an area that we, we look at um, regularly as well, and it's monitored through the systems performance and review and improvement through the federal uh, government for monitoring special education. <laughs> but it's not monitored in general, Ed. But we like to take a look at this, and we, we present and talk to districts about this, uh, when we're talking about interventions because it's very significant both with kids that aren't classified with special education needs but, and also for kids who are, as you can see the disproportionality. Now, now these uh, percentage rates were compared to the whole population. If we, can, if we compare special education kids just with other special education kids, 
the disproportionality rates are greater. I just wanted to clarify that. This is a, an area that we really need to hone in on as well, and we have been. I think that comes to the end of the slides. Krista, did you want to add anything? No, I would just, um, in reference to the different terminology used in the report, um, we just took reporting directly from the providers, and so there is some difference in language as people are tracking. Thank you. So I think we want to take a few minutes of conversation, uh, really not to be able to dive into the meat of this because we're not going to be able to in the two or three minutes that the state board has left. But really, what do we want to, as the two boards and council, what do we want to do with this? Let me just say uh, for this, for the, our board member colleagues that are here, when the Early Learning Council looked at this information last month, um, and we looked at the fact that there are no recorded ex suspensions or expulsions in early learning, publicly funded early <coughs> learning programs. There just aren't any. Um, we, don't, we don't believe that, um, we believe while well, that is true, we don't believe that there isn't shifting. And our belief, although we can't, we, the data that the department keeps is not possible for us to know this for sure, but our belief is that in practice, what happens is kids get referred uh, for early childhood special education, um, or they get moved around from program to program. While there's no official suspension or expulsion, we believe they're shifting that occurs, particularly to early childhood special education. So that's a, and given the special education data that Mike just showed, it's a really important conversation for us to have. So what do we want to do with this? How do we want to talk about it? Do we want to talk about it? What are our thoughts? Yes, Randy and then uh, Eva. I'd say one of our greatest challenges in school system is, is not dealing with students who have issues coming in. It's not knowing what the issues are when they come in. And I think that connection with early learning is uh, something that we need to continue to work on. So. Really important. Uh, for those that couldn't hear, it's not dealing, the issue at, at entry to kindergarten not, is not, not dealing with kids who have issues. It's just not knowing what those issues are so that they can be dealt with appropriately. Eva. Um, I just wanted to add that I had some informal conversations with our child care some of our child care providers <coughs> and then the, the child care representatives um, and there are that you know, for child care they can call behavior specialists but sometimes there's not availability to get them there quickly enough um, and then you know in Usually, child care doesn't have the option of removing a child from a program unless the parent's not paying. Um, and then it's just dealing with how do you talk with the parent about behavior issues, too, so that it's not looked upon as a failure. Um, so they have trouble with that. And so if we can help child care providers connect with behavior specialists early on, you know, and maybe have more behavior specialists to be able to you know, access and then you know make sure that child care providers know that that's available. Mm -hmm. I think that was the biggest thing is a lot of them didn't know or don't know. Really important, Lynn. And then, uh, and then Bobby and then Angela and then Rob. And then we're gonna wrap this up. So Lynn, Bobby, Angela, Rob. Lynn. So a uh, couple quick things. One is that in the CCO formation there is, and we need to connect these dots, there is, there is behavioral specialists available too child care um, providers and that's it not that it's in place now but there's a, a process for that to occur that's critical two is I we see all the time these are my kids uh, we see all the time that this has everything to do with the adults and not about the kids this is what's easy this is what's expedient mm -hmm. um, we can get into the the issue of why it's mostly boys why it's mostly minorities and, and I think one of the things we as the Early Learning Council and as the Department of Ed has to address is the assessment of the people making the decision and holding them accountable to what they're doing. Because I think this data shows both that we have a challenge, but the challenge is on both sides of the equation and it's not just on the children's side of the equation. Um, and we've seen it time and again. So I, I think we have a, the ODE has a regulatory responsibility to look at the people making these decisions and to assess the caliber of those decisions as well as addressing the behavioral needs of the children. Thank you. I think we had Bobby and then An Angela and then <coughs> Rob. Oh, well, I'm just gonna follow up that you um, seen the it's on gender I, I um, there's whole books written on our society's inability to deal 
appropriately with male children in groups and um, especially the African-American male. And so this was, uh, I think this is an indicator just, a, you know, a, of a much larger problem. And I, I just couldn't, I mean, I just think on both the board and our side, it's a very serious problem that the range of behavior for children has narrowed, narrowed, <sighs> narrowed. So <sighs> we're de defining normal behavior as, um, as a problem and that's especially for, that's an especially gendered problem. The, the motion and noise of little guys is um, seen as unacceptable when it's very normal. And um, so I don't know where it fits on agenda. Um, it seems <laughs> that it's a professional development issue for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, and that ties to the behavior of adults. You know, what do you do? What kind of environment do you create for children that, especially for young children, accepts a lot of m movement and noise uh, amongst males? <laughs> we've you. even pathologized it. We've gone so far with pr considering it abnormal that we've pathologized it, which brings in the health yes. piece. Yes. Yes. Again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Angela and then Rob. Okay, so uh, the environment I think is something we need to have a look at. And it, the environment for children um, across all races needs to be a welcoming environment. And I'm not saying that people aren't creating a welcoming environment, but they're creating it in their cultural perspective. So I think it's important that as educators that we create environments that include and help our students of various races feel welcome <coughs> and as important as the next child. So that's the first thing. And I would like to see, um, because a lot of the students are experiencing cultural shocks from their families to the learning environments. Um, also, um, minority teachers would be um, another way of helping our students um, have some um, you know, someone to relate to that's more like their their aunts and their uncles and um, and there's room and because um, I've uh, heard the statistics of how many teachers we have that are minorities and such there's plenty of room for that and there's professional education programs who produce those teachers uh, also we we're going to look at this children as in a holistic way then we want to help the parents feel welcome along with their students and which that might um, spark some materials that the t that the parents can take home to kind of make that um, school home connection a natural connection not a not one where parents feel like they're not welcome or if their children is having problems that they're always coming in for a um, because they're in trouble kind of a feeling but um, more of a welcoming environment for parents and families as a whole and then uh, because of that good experience with the school uh, and the environment that's going to be a good experience being spoke in the families about school which will affect the children's perspective of what it is to get an education so I think it's really important if the experience is bad at an early age with the child and, the, and this is my opinion, um, with the child and the parents, what's spoken in the home is going to make a difference about whether or not the child is going to accept, feel welcome, and, and um, thrive in an education environment. Okay? Thank you. That's Rob. I just want to think about what policy or, or direction setting that we can do that would, you know, think about this in a way that improves what we're seeing. I mean, certainly the, the disparity is unacceptable, um, both by gender and by race. But just, you know, what, what would we think about? What policy would we want to put in place? And we really have to know what this looks like. I mean, what does this mean? What's happening, right? And so as a person, as a K-12 practitioner, and I know Randy would um, jump right in on this, 
you know, there is this, there is this dynamic uh, societally between this expectation of safety, zero tolerance for certain behaviors, mm -hmm. and zero tolerance policies that have been set that really yep. um, hamper yep. uh, sort of some, even some flexibility within how to deal with issues where parents feel like their child is threatened when they come to school by behaviors that their children exhibit. And that is where we get into a really odd dynamic with things. As a superintendent for 12 years, and I, I cannot remember a time, and somebody will, may be able to say that's not true, Rob. I can't remember a time where we ever expelled a kid, uh, uh, kindergarten through third grade. Um, there were a few times where we said, we need a couple of days to figure this out. And so, you know, we need, your, we need your child to stay at home for a couple of days as we work to put together a plan about how we're going to deal with this. Make sure that every child in the say in the school in this in in the classroom is in a safe learning environment, that everybody feels um, good and safe, and it, we may have to think about some placement. We may need to think about some sort of intensive intervention about how we're going to get there and that kind of thing. But there is a real dynamic there, right? Within we're looking at 2.6 percent of students that are either suspended or expelled, and that is a those two things are extremely different, right? Suspended or expelled. Expelled means you don't get to come back. Um, it, and it means there's still a duty to educate. So even when a child is expelled, the district has a duty to educate. What that education looks like can be a little bit different, um, except for in certain circumstances where there's extreme questions of safety. I don't think I've ever seen an extreme question of safety K through three, right? And so uh, the only reason I want to bring this up is because as we think about how to set policy around this, we need to understand what is, what's actually taking place in the school, what it looks like, and the tool set that we have around the policy that would help encourage schools not to expel. If there is an, a suspension, that it be of extremely short duration and that, there is, that, and that plans are put in place to make sure that we're able to accept the child back into the school in a way that's going to ha help them be successful and have all other children feel safe in a learning environment that's going to be conducive to get them where we want to have them. Thank you. So I know this is a really important conversation, but our call cardiologist has left the room for the day, and I don't want to have a defibrillator at the back of the room when people are trying to get us to go. So we're going to wrap this, part, this, this conversation up. I apologize. It's a really, really important topic. We are not even scratching the surface today. I'd like to suggest, if there aren't any objections, that we have a dedicated conversation, joint conversation, Early Learning Council Board of Education um, on this particular topic. I, I would leave it to Rob and Jada to help figure out how to best <coughs> set that up. But um, I think there are some things we can be doing in the meantime on the Early Learning Council <coughs> side to think about how we um, sort of uh, round out and deliver, at least articulate if not deliver, a reduction of perception of some of those problems. So we can work on that. If you all could think about what those realities and policies are, then let's come back together and have a conversation about how it meets up. Does that seem like a reasonable way to proceed? Yes. Okay. Uh, apologies. Again, we had a really packed agenda this morning full of fabulous and interesting topics. Uh, we just <coughs> didn't have enough time dedicated to do justice to any one of them. So I want to say uh, thank you to the Board of Education for uh, having us um, join you and part of your meeting. We wish you well on your tour. Uh, thanks again to the uh, Intermountain ESD uh, for hosting us today. And we're, we're going to look forward to the next uh, conversation. Sounds good. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, council members, we are in recess for about 10 minutes. And thank oh. you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Dick. Um, and then I think you guys are boarding a bus. I'm not sure what you're doing. We're getting on the bus. You're getting on the bus. OK, board members on the bus, council members in recess for 10 minutes. Folks on the phone, we're going to put you on mute. Okay.